through um, what the world is going to look like uh, when this is done. Um, you know, rates are certainly higher than they were, but they're still going to remain relatively low. Uh, central banks are going to, um, you know, be there in a way that they weren't uh, during uh, pr prior recessions, if you will. Um, so you're going to have a lot of liquidity once we come out of this. You're going to have uh, low rates. Um, you need to al allocate around, you know, what you think uh, does well in that kind of environment. Hopefully it's, it's, a, it's a quick bounce back. Um, you know, and then, and then the, the growth stories that uh, you liked before are going to be the growth stories that you like afterwards. Um, if you're a little bit more pessimistic, then you need to allocate around that. But I think this is the time to really think about what the world looks like when we get out of this, because we will. And, and, and hopefully it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Well, and that echoes what we heard yesterday from President Trump in the press conference with the Treasury Secretary, Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin. Uh, Chet, and he was basically like, we're going to get out of this, and when we do, we're going to be off to the races. The U.S. economy is really going to accelerate, and it's going to be great. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, I think, yeah, I, think, I agree that we will come back uh, strongly whenever we do. But the, the concern is, uh, is, what is the duration for which the virus pulls us back? So I would say that, you know, if our base case is true, that you do get the virus speaking out in second half of April or May, uh, I think we will come back uh, relatively strongly. Mm -hmm. But if it gets into the third quarter, then we are talking about a serious uh, problem in terms of corporate credit losses that we will suffer and the impact on the banking system. So I think it does depend on uh, how we are held back because of this uh, coronavirus. All right, Chet, and really appreciate you joining us with your call. Chet and I of Morgan Stanley and Marvin Lowe of State Street uh, will be sticking with me. I do want to break some news for you. Uh, with oil prices at 24, what are certain companies doing? Uh, Conoco out with the latest. They're cutting their 2020 CapEx view as well as their buyback uh, target. Um, it, it, it's been <coughs> taking a long time for some companies to figure out how much they're going to want to cut. Uh, Parsley also uh, cutting below $1 billion in terms of their uh, CapEx. Uh, so Conoco cutting their 2020 CapEx view and their buyback target. Uh, it's going to impact 2020 production guidance by, by, by about 20 million barrels of oil equivalent a day. Um, they're going to have to reduce their uh, share repurchase program uh, to a quarterly run rate of $250 million, uh, beginning in the second quarter. Uh, Conoco typically has always been out in front of making these kind of sacrifices. Back in the day in the last oil crash, they were one of the first to cut their dividends, and it wound up really paying off for them as they were able to recalibrate and get on uh, a different track faster, and they really were very capital disciplined. Other companies followed suit, so interesting to know what they're doing, cutting their capex as well as their buyback target. All right, let's get an update now. It's making news outside the business world. Viviana Artado is here with First Word News. Viviana? Alex, we begin with U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. He warns if there's no stimulus package, unemployment in the U.S. could hit 20%. He's pitching a $1.2 trillion plan. It would see $1,000 checks. $1.2 trillion. Dollars. Boy, that's crazy. A national emergency for the coronavirus. Is that how much No, I'm just looking now, at the news. The US and Canada, they'll soon ban non-essential and non-business travel between the two countries. Bloomberg has learned an announcement could come today. One official calls it basically a ban on tourism and vacations. And Joe Biden tightening his grip on the race for the Democratic presidential nomination. Yesterday, he swept all three primaries, Arizona, Florida, and Illinois. Now, the former vice president has more than half the 2,000 or so delegates he needs for the Democratic nomination. Oh. He also has a 284 delegate lead over rival Bernie Sanders. Global News, 24 hours a day on air at Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Viviana Todd. I'm going to turn your volume down a little bit. All right, thanks so I can much, hear your Viviana. Keyboard. Coming up, FedEx is spending its financial forecast, the latest company to do so. The it's all good. The it's all good. Blurring its demand outlook. More on that next in today's bottom line. And remember, Bloomberg users interact with the charts shown using GTV Go on the terminal. Browse everything. That Meet Tony. Tony has a good job where he works during the day, but he's always dreamed of owning his own business. He's not ready to leave his day job just yet, but he's just looking for a low-cost, home-based business, he can make additional income. Damn, everything is straight tanking. That tells me that this buyer is going to make things worse. It don't matter to me, though. I'm, as, hold on, I'm going to turn it back up. Tell you back a little bit. So... When you're being a scalpel like this, it don't really matter. 
You know what I mean? It's for them long traders that it matters for. And where's the money at? The long traders or the scalpers? I mean, both. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just, and really both, to be honest. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. I'm Viviana Tato coming to you live from the principal room. Coming up later today, Scott Miner, Guggenheim Global CIO. Bloomberg Daybreak. I'm Viviana Artado with your Bloomberg Business Flash. And we begin with deeper cuts on the way at United Airlines. In April, United will slash international flights by 85%. It's also cutting flights across the U.S. and Canada by 42%. The drop in demand because of the coronavirus is set to be worse than after the 9-11 terror attacks. Now to a warning from Barclays. The British bank might struggle to reach its profit target because of coronavirus. It could lead to bonuses being cut. Barclays finance director saying low interest rates posing additional challenges. And we end with a firm that was once Apple's biggest bull. Now warning of dark days ahead. Wedbush slashing its price target from $400 to $300. $35. It says the coronavirus I don't know how to execute this will kind of have story. a major negative impact on Apple for the foreseeable future. It expects the 5G iPhones will not get released this fall as planned. I'm Viviana Tato, and that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Alex. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Viviana. Time now for bottom line. We're going to look at three things worth watching this morning. First up, uh, Brooke Settle of Bloomberg Opinion it joins me along with Marvin Lowe of Straits, State Street. Want to kick it off? Uh, with FedEx uh, basically scrapping their guidance, not the only company to have to do so. Not the only company to have to do so, but what I thought was interesting is there is actually a benefit in all of this for FedEx. I mean, to the extent that there can be any, of course, with the whole country, the whole world really concerned about the spread of this virus. But, you know, a lot of cargo gets carried in the belly of passenger jets. With most of those jets now not flying, particularly internationally, a lot of that workload is now falling to FedEx. So they are seeing a little bit of a boom there. The caveat, of course, is if we do see a recession, that will impact FedEx, that will impact the flow of goods. But you also have a lot of people at home right now ordering a lot of things, depending on delivery men to get those items to them. So FedEx is seeing a little bit of an uptick from that, actually. Which begs the question, Marvin, like, how do you even look at uh, What's up, Ian? multiple and model earnings Yeet. for the rest of this year? What's up, bro? That's, that, that, that's ultimately a great question. Um, you know, certainly at the at the single stock level, it's, it's not a, an area that I generally um, traffic in. Um, I do look at, however, the um, change in guidance language. And, um, you know, this is really the start of what I think is going to be a cascade of companies either pulling and or, and or reducing their numbers. So, um, you know, we need to ultimately get to that E before we can really uh, put a forward PE. Um, and we need guidance because, you know, ultimately all of us analysts, uh, whether we're looking at single stocks or whether we're looking at global macro, fact, I'll just have um, a small lot you know, size. don't have any idea how many oh, of this is be. really going to uh, – uh, Memo, the, it's like point zero one. it's 10 cent, remember that? just so unknown. Oh, yeah, yeah, fair yeah. point, and that's also leading to the other story, which is autos. So we have auto companies from Europe as well as the U.S. kind of closing down plants uh, for two weeks. At the same time, uh, auto buying in China is literally falling off a cliff. Uh, Brooke, in your reporting, what do you notice? 
I mean, I think it's really notable that now we have the U.S. automakers also looking at partial plant <clears throat> shutdowns, at least on a rotating basis. You're right, we did see that in Europe, but to see that spreading in the U.S., that then raises concerns for me about other parts of the industrial supply chain. Boeing has had a number of its employees test positive for COVID-19. There's a question about whether they may do potentially pause production at some of their plants, similar to what Airbus did in France. This has significant knock-on effects. Once you start shutting down factories, this does get a lot worse very quickly, particularly for the industrial side of the economy. Well, fair point. And then I also want to pivot uh, to oil companies because in some ways that's really the story of the market today as well. Uh, oil at $24 a barrel, Conoco just coming out. They're trimming their, their buyback program. They're trimming their CapEx. Uh, Brooke, when you look at this sector, the trickle down is also going to be amazing from to oil services and then to the guys that actually manufacture the stuff like a GE, for example. Right. I mean, because I think these companies are so want to cut their dividend. They are so sacred for the big oil companies in particular. So you're going to see these cuts come on buybacks and come on CapEx. You were talking about ConocoPhillips earlier today. That is another spending cut. That does trickle down to some of these oil services and equipment providers. And a lot of industrial companies are still exposed here. They're less exposed than they were. We saw a huge round of breakups in the wake of that 2015, 2016 oil collapse, where a lot of industrial companies actually jettisoned their energy exposure. But those that didn't are definitely feeling the pain. So I think a lot about Emerson, which does have exposure on the automation side. They do a lot of process automation for energy companies. And then you mentioned GE, a big part of their leveraging plan, deleveraging plan, was to sell their remaining stake in Baker Hughes. They still have about 37% of that. That is worth a lot less than what it was. So that also affects you know, the resources that they have coming in to improve their balance sheet, to weather this crisis at a time when it's also hitting their aviation business very hard. It's such a good point, Brooke. Uh, Marvin, when you take a look at WTI trading at 24 and Brent at 27, literally, what are you thinking when you see those headlines? Yeah, I, I mean, um, um, the first thing I think about is is what is the pain point for uh, Saudi Arabia and, 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 and Russia? Mm -hmm. um, certainly they entered into this as, as big boys having tried to go down this route before. Um, so they, they probably are... Um, uh, they probably have thought through the process that it could get here. Um, does this bring them back to the table? So that's kind of first and foremost. And then really the knock-on effects into the corporate bond market, which is incredibly stressed already um, with kind of the energy component leading that stress. Uh, you know, all of this is just another, um, another data point to, to really look at whether or not that stress um, continues to, to make the corporate bond market as, as challenging of a place as it is. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because junk bond investors over the last two days have been the worst since the collapse uh, of Lehman Brothers for those investors. Uh, Marvin, when you take a look at the credit space, um, are, are we throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Like, are we going to wind up seeing defaults in the energy space, but there's still going to be some value in corporate credit, or is this going to really bleed into other industries also? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I think I think we are throwing um, the baby out with the bathwater to a certain degree. You've got a lot of uh, high quality companies with uh, okay balance sheets, you know, decent cash flows that um, you know survived the crisis and uh, are probably you know uh, well suited to, to deal with this to a certain degree. Um, I do think, however, that the overall stresses in the entire market is something that the Fed's going to address. So, you know, really potentially understanding um, this new CP uh, line that they put out there, uh, maybe some of the encouragement to try to um, get primary dealers to, to increase their inventories via the, the primary dealer facility that was announced. And, you know, the continued talk that the Fed might buy corporates is, is something that's important for the sector. That's also a good point, too. Uh, Brogan, I just want to sort of wrap up on what you brought up in terms of a lot of these companies relying on asset sales, and that was part of the way they're going to fund uh, their next journey as a company. Um, oil companies front and center, like they want to just <coughs> the Fed and sell assets in order to free up free cash flow to pay dividends, pay buybacks. Um, I have to wonder how something like that's renegotiated, if there's a breakup clause where you say, here's a fee and I can get out of this kind of sale. Right. I mean, I think most of these deals probably do have breakup fees, but what will be interesting to see is if there's any sort of clause in there for some type of event like what we're seeing, a pandemic. I mean, a lot of times when these deals fall apart, it's mostly because you couldn't get regulatory approval. Remember when that was our biggest problem? So, look, I think you're going to see a lot of these deals maybe being rethought, and it's not just necessarily on the oil side, too. I mean, I think across the spectrum, when you cannot get bankers from point A to point B, that does tend to put a crimp in the flow of M&A, and also the value of everything has been completely thrown up in the air, so I would expect to see some price renegotiations at the very least, and some of these deals probably are not going to get done.
All right, I really appreciate that perspective, Brooke Sutherland of Bloomberg Opinion. And Marvin Lowe of State Street, really great to catch up with you as well. Thank you for your insight this morning. Uh, coming up, the helicopter money, well, it's coming. And that means a perfect storm for, <coughs> you know it, higher gold prices. We're talking about that in today's Technically Speaking. And if you're heading out, jumping into your car, tune into Bloomberg Radio. Heard across the U.S. and Sirius XM, Channel 119. And on the Bloomberg Business app, this is Bloomberg. All right, time for Technically Speaking. We'll set you up for some trades of the day. Joining me now on the phone is Mike McGlone, Bloomberg Intelligence Commodities Strategist. I know you're looking at gold. It is down $26, though, despite the fact that we're going to see a blowout of debt-to-GDP, which is what you're looking at. Hi, Alex. Yeah, 20 bucks, a blip in the trend when you're looking to make, you know, when you, it looks like it probably will double in value, and that's not profound. That's just what happened last time. On this first chart, we see U.S. debt-to-GDP it's almost a guarantee it's going to blow out, running at 108 percent. The last time we did, you know, had cut to zero was kind of circled in the chart was 2008. That's when debt to GDP just launched above 65 percent. Gold was kind of peaking around 1,000, and then it took off. I see it in a very similar environment now. I don't know what it's going to take to hold gold down other than right now it's short-term margin call selling. That should be temporary, and the market should go back to fundamentals, which, which you see here are quite bullish. Which leads me to the next chart, which is volatility, because the more volatility you have and lack of liquidity, the more gold's going to suffer if you have to sell the winners. In the short term, but in the bigger picture, rising stock market volatility is a, bull, a bid for gold. So what you see in this chart here is I think is a better way to look at the VIX. It's a 20-day average. It's yeah. probably going to take out that high from 2008. Why? Because we just made an all-time new high. And the biggest significance is looking there, you know, in that little circle there, that shows the one on the far right. That's from 2017. That was the lowest level as ever for 20-day volatility. I mean, history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. The same thing happened in 2007, and we saw what happened. So now the market has a worthy catalyst to just go back and mean revert to new highs. All right, Mike, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Mike McGlone of Bloomberg Intelligence helping you set up uh, from perspective for today. That wraps it up here at Bloomberg Daybreak Americas. Coming up on the open with John Affaro, Tiffany Wilding, a PIMCO chief U.S. economist, uh, will be joining him as S&P futures yet again hit limit down as bond yields over uh, in Europe surge and the dollar uh, still hangs on strong and oil gets completely wiped out at $24 a barrel. This is Bloomberg. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
from New York City for the audience worldwide. I'm Jonathan Farrow. The countdown to the open starts right now. With 30 minutes until the opening bell this morning, good morning, good morning. Here is your brutal Wednesday morning price action. Equity futures have been limit down since 1 a.m. Eastern time. We haven't moved since then. If you switch up the board, here's your price action. Going into the opening bell, 30 minutes away in the United States of America. The Spider S&P 500 ETF is down. It is down hard. It's negative 6.53%. So that's your price action. Let's get to the big issue, shall we, where we've gone from all-time highs in the stock market to zero rates, QE, and helicopter money, all within a month. February 19th, feeling like a lifetime ago. That was the top, the longest bull market ever, turning into the quickest bear market on record. In just a few weeks, Fed Chair Jay Powell <coughs> has gone from sounding patient to cutting rates to zero, resuming quantitative easing, and hoping to avoid a freezing up of financial markets. Not even two weeks ago, Larry Kudlow, the National Economic Council director on this very show, saying we're in the camp that wants timely and targeted micromeasures. We don't want to willy-nilly throw 300 to $400 billion with a $1,000 check to every American. And now guess what? The Trump administration pushing a $1.2 trillion stimulus plan, including sending $1,000 checks to every American. We're looking at sending checks to Americans immediately. Americans need cash now, and the president wants to get cash now. And I mean now in the next two weeks. It's going to be big, and it's going to be bold. And the uh, level, again, of enthusiasm to get something done, uh, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. For complete team coverage, let's bring the team in. Bloomberg's Kevin Cirilli, Taylor Riggs, and Michael McKee with us now. And Kevin, big, bold, and wow, a change of tune in the last couple of weeks. Absolutely. Based upon conversations that I've had with uh, law the lawmaker staffers on Capitol Hill, as well as administration officials, they quickly, quickly, quickly want to get liquidity into everyday Americans. And based upon the timetable, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell vowing to keep the Senate open until economic stimulus is on the way. That first piece of economic stimulus, which would provide for free coronavirus testing, as well as two weeks of paid sick leave is still making its way through the Senate after a hurdle put forth by an amendment that virtually has no chance of passing from Kentucky Senator Rand Paul. But beyond that, the larger, nearly $1 trillion worth of stimulus has the Treasury Department and Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, yeah. working virtually round the clock. From the president's standpoint, Jonathan, I would note two things. First and foremost, at 10.45 a.m. Yeah, I'm time, just, I'm in the trade right now. Will participate in the Look, business okay. roundtable quarterly meeting he will participate via the Oval Office on a telecall. And then at about 11.30 a.m. New York time, we're going to get that coronavirus task force briefing, more updates from the president, the vice president, and his team. So this situation continues to uh, to continues to intensify yeah. from an economic standpoint. And Jonathan, just a final quick point. In talking with lawmakers on Capitol Hill, they're really, the, the partisan lines have very much dissipated. <coughs> Every lawmaker is, is, is working from the same political playbook, which is get economic stimulus to Americans as quickly as possible. Everyone seemingly on the same side, Kevin. It's good to see, especially in the last 24 hours. The administration's big push here, a $1.2 trillion fiscal stimulus plan, and the talk of helicopter money in America, sparking a massive sell-off in the bond market, particularly in yesterday's session. And on some parts of the curve, seeing yield spike the most since 1982. Taking a look at that, Taylor Riggs. Hey, Taylor. Yeah, John, with the big equity route, you would think that there would be a flight to quality and a bid for safe havens across the board. That's only the case on the two-year yield, which is falling, thanks in part to Jay Powell. But on the 10 and the 30-year yield, they are rising, thanks in part to strategists waking up this morning and figuring out how large the fiscal deficits are going to be and how the heck we're going to pay for a $1.2 trillion stimulus package. Flip of the board, I want to come and take a look at a chart here that I'm showing inside my terminal. Now showing the divergence between rates and break-evens. This is largely due to an issue within the Treasury market, not the break-even market as we know. Uh, BMO's rate strategist said part of this is liquidity issues. You do have some profit taking after the massive 10-year yield rally. And then, of course, the preference of cash over everything else. John. Taylor Ricks, that's been the story over the last couple of weeks. Credit, fixed income firmly in the driving seat. We'll discuss that in just a moment. For the Fed, we've had the big rate cuts. 
We're getting QE, let's call it QE, that's what it is now. And we're seeing a series of programs released almost every five minutes at the moment from the FOMC, operated, executed by the New York Fed. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Mike McKee to get up to speed. What have they been up to the last 24 hours, Mike? Well, you know, John, as companies start to close down, cash start, stops flowing through the economy, and that could turn the health crisis into a financial crisis. So the Fed is using its emergency powers to restart two lending programs from 2008. Commercial paper, which many companies use an IOU to sort of tide them over to make payroll and meet uh, accounts payable, has seized up. And so the Fed right, is so going <clears> through that, this thing that you're looking creating at? a special purpose vehicle that will buy commercial paper from dealers and they will hold it uh, to maturity. Cost is 200 basis points above the current Fed funds limit, so about 240 basis points today. A little more expensive than the markets thought, but it is there. The Treasury Department providing a $10 billion guarantee to make sure the Fed doesn't lose money on that. Then, last night, the Fed reopened a lending program for primary dealers similar to the Fed's discount window for banks. They will be able to <coughs> borrow from the Fed at 25 basis points, which is the same amount you would pay at the discount window. In return, they put up collateral, a much wider range of collateral. Uh -oh. They can use, even use equities, mostly investment-grade credits, however. But uh, munis, uh, uh, mortgage-backed securities, uh, CMBS also eligible for those. And finally, they have now announced that for the rest of the week, they're going to run two overnight repo auctions a day. The $500 billion uh, auctions are available. There's not getting that much take up, but they are going to be available and running them twice a day to make sure that there's enough money in the markets. And the question, John, is what do they do next? Some people speculating they'll reopen the TALF, which is a targeted asset back. You put asset back loans together like uh, auto uh, loans, and that should help that industry go forward. So look for more from the... Gold is hard to trade that. sometimes, man. Well, suggestion as well, Mike, mm. from Janet Yellen. And from Ben Bernanke, former Fed chairs in the FT this morning, that maybe they should ask permission to buy corporate credit. Perhaps that's something you and I can talk about a little bit later in the week. Mike, you're my policy guy. You're the guy I come to for these kind of conversations. I want to park the price action just for a moment. I know it's incredibly important, but there is a, a risk Forex of allowing demo, the price that's actions the almost exclusively yeah. write the narrative for us. It's early days, and I know there's a lot more work to do. To but you've got demo. officials in America and beyond really what's taking up? this house price so, very seriously in a way. Sir Raj, what's up, man? Monetary policy is all guns blazing. There's a huge fiscal stimulus effort coming together. Can you see a bridge over some really troubled waters slowly coming together, Mike, just from the policy moves you've seen in the last week? Yeah, you absolutely can. The Fed has put a bridge over troubled waters for financial markets to ensure that they keep working. Remember, after Lehman Brothers, everything seized up and stayed that way for a <clears throat> while, and there was fear that money might not even come out of the ATMs in the U.S. That seems to be an issue that the Fed is trying to put behind them. And the question now is uh, how quickly Congress can move. When they issued checks in 2008, it took two or three months. This might be over by then. So can they move quickly on the fiscal side as well? If they do, that might put a, a floor under confidence and enable uh, the economy to go forward with less damage than otherwise. So bills to pay, month end. Mike, great to catch up with you as always. The conversation will continue right here on Bloomberg TV. Pleased to say, joining us from Minneapolis, Tony Rodriguez, Nuveen Chief, Fixed Income Strategist. Tony, always great to get your thoughts on this program. Let's talk about what's happening in Fixed Income. A big question a lot of people are asking at the moment. Good job, good day. Become a credit crunch. That's good, that man. Something you're worried about, what are you Tony? doing today? Well, we're certainly worried about it because it certainly could come true um, that a liquidity freeze would create a solvency problem and a credit crunch. So we think the Fed is uh, certainly aware of the situation right now. They're acting aggressively. Damn, I want to get in this one right here. The liquidity issues. There's another trade scenario we right here. Lines and we saw a pretty significant over $100 billion <clears throat> takedown in Europe uh, today on that. Uh, whether it's addressing some of the issuers in the commercial paper market and the financing issues with all of their repo programs. But we think they're going to have to go further because right now there's still issues for money market funds getting liquidity when they meet, if they have to meet redemptions. So we think they'll have to be a little more aggressive there. And right now the Fed is really moving into the position of kind of buyer of last resort, whether that's buyer of treasuries through their QE purchases or moving into buyers of commercial paper and potentially other assets in the credit markets. Because right now, investors are worried about redemptions. They need liquidity. Dealer balance sheets are pretty full. The primary dealer credit facility will certainly help in that uh, regard.
but right now there just needs to be greater liquidity in the market, but also an ultimate buyer of credit risk, which I think is where we're going to have to see the Fed and Treasury and the administration really step in with some creative programs in order to unlock the markets. Tony, this is where I worry, and I know a lot of people are throwing that word around, worry, over the last couple of weeks, but it is a worry and a legitimate one. I'm encouraged by the policy moves of the last couple of weeks, but there is a question as to whether it's just too late, that they haven't been able to get in front of this, and this health crisis sparks a period of messy defaults and deleveraging that will stick with us for quite a while, even after this health crisis fades. Dare I ask, is that your base case now, Tony? No, that's, that's not our base case. Uh, I would say that there are particular industries where that may in fact be the base case. So if we look at, say, the energy market, not only are they dealing with all of the health crisis, economic issues, et cetera, but there's also a very specific energy market crisis going on given the battle uh, between Russia and Saudi Arabia. And there you're getting not only a demand, you know, destruction <coughs> problem in the energy market, but also an excess supply problem. So there I think we could see and, and will see uh, a pretty significant increase in defaults. When you think of some of the other areas, like maybe travel and leisure, absent some federal assistance, uh, there you would see substantial, I think, increases in defaults. More broadly, if uh, some of the social distancing um, requirements that are being put in place yeah. <coughs> to bend the curve, that then I think could uh, allow us to kind of avoid kind of the worst case full-on credit crisis. Tony, we're all hopeful that happens. You mentioned crude. It just drops across the Bloomberg. Brent crude to the lowest level since 03. Brent crude right now with a 27 handle. I've got a 23 handle on WTI. It has been so painful in the commodity market. And for credit too, if you look at U.S. high-yield energy spreads, record wides. Unlike anything we saw even at the height of the financial crisis, record wides for high yield U.S. energy spreads. I want to continue the conversation in credit and bring in Brian Weinstein, Morgan Stanley, head of global fixed income. He joins us on the phone. Brian, talk to me about how broad based the pain in credit is right now, because quite clearly, as I say, this is really tough in the energy space. How much broader is that pain, though? I think it's broad because people are looking for liquidity at any price, and obviously fixed income isn't really meant to, to, to be that liquidity source. What's interesting is that you're actually seeing some of these programs in the U.S. begin to work. In other words, I think liquidity and pricing in, U, in U.S. investment-grade credit is actually better than it is in Europe, where the, the response has been uh, weaker and slower. <coughs> Brian, we've got a really big problem, though, haven't we? And I've been talking about the individual characteristics of different asset classes for quite a while. Jeff Curry at Goldman Sachs does a great job of this. The hopes and dreams of an anticipatory asset class like equities in the back seat. In the front seat, you've got a commodity market that needs to clear supply and demand at spot. And we've got storage issues in this very moment, crude rolling over aggressively. In the credit market, some near-term and very real credit risk. Can you meet coupon payments? Can you deleverage quickly enough to make sure that you can bolster your balance sheet through a really, really tough period? Brian, that's the story right now. Front seat, credit risk, commodity risk, growth risk. How do you work through those stories? And I'll ask you the following question because it's important. Mark Dow inspired this one, fund manager. There is a positive correlation between risk appetite and price. It's very unique and slightly <coughs> counterintuitive. But in markets, when prices are climbing, risk appetite goes with it. And when price is falling, risk appetite goes So your goes trading with it. view is and like it won't be price immediately that updated. Sentiment. It's got to come from somewhere else. Where does it Depending come from? Depending on the time you're looking at. I'm looking at the 15 minute candle. If you look at the four hour candle. Well, also, yeah. Yeah, this is power. It just depends on the other time you're looking at. And I think if you, you know, I mean, like I'm looking at the 15 minute deeper, candle. Look at what the Fed has done in coordination with the Treasury. That's what they're good. trying to do is give people access to liquidity. In other words, if you can issue CP, if you can get some short term funding and slow the chain down a little bit, you're right. The price doesn't matter. People are hitting it indiscriminate prices. But that goes wrong if people feel like they have balance sheet and they have the ability to survive. And then you'll get investors coming out, uh, maybe even at higher prices and, and taking taking down some of this risk. So I think you're right. The problem is a spot problem. Everyone wants to do something right now, but the solution is going to come over the next days and weeks as these programs start to work, and it's really a matter of bridging that gap and, and, and making sure we bring back confidence. Uh, it won't be easy, but I think we're on the path in the U.S. Hey, Brian, great to catch up with you. My special thanks to you, and my best to you and yours and to the whole of the team over at Morgan Stanley. Brian Weinstein there. I want to get you up to speed on some breaking news, and it comes across the Bloomberg terminal. Let's cross over to Kelly Lyons. Hey, Kelly.
Hey, John, breaking news from right here in New York City. Mayor Bill de Blasio saying there are almost 1,000 coronavirus cases in the city, about 923 to be exact. He also says that New York City needs military assistance. Again, this is coming from Mayor <coughs> Bill de Blasio. We'll continue to keep you updated on all of those coronavirus headlines, John. Kelly Lyons will do our best right here on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio as well. Coming up on the program, a historic plunge in investor sentiment. We're digging into Bank of America's fund manager survey, and we do that with Jared Woodard. That conversation is coming up and next and later an interview with Tiffany Wilding, PIMCO, Chief U.S. Economist. We'll do that a little okay, bit later on the program. The From New York concept. City this morning. Good morning. Um, at the top right here. Washington, D.C. with a huge stimulus plan on the table. Oh, you see it on my stream earlier. Really. I forgot to delay. Oh, I see it. Yeah. <laughs> See it on your screen. I just don't on my screen. Premium user? Nope. Finance minister, with whom the ECB can come nope, I got the free account. Very, very evident. So there's a flaw at the heart of the Eurozone, and what we're now seeing is this, the uh, do a 15 second one. You have to be not helped, user. of course, by you said 215 the seconds. Last week by the ECB in terms of saying, well, it's not our responsibility, these spreads. No, for 15 minutes. No, 15 the minutes. I'm on 15 minutes. This morning after Austria's oh, Central okay. Bank Governor Robert Holzman <clears throat> said the Central Bank's Governing Council is out of tools. The ECB delivered a really minute? rare slapdown. Uh, so just it's not as accurate. Out, that the ECB stands ready to adjust all of its measures as appropriate. Should you want a, a more of a stronger trend? In the banking system and okay. to ensure the yeah, smooth transmission like of its monetary policy in all jurisdictions. And guess what? Shortly after that, Holzman later walking back his comment saying, quote, monetary policy hasn't reached its limits. Michael McKee joining us now, Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. It's been a little bit messy over the last week, hasn't it, Mike? Yeah, it's bad enough if you're having transmission problems because your spreads are widening. But when you do it to yourself in a crisis, that's not good. You called this a long time ago, John, on the 12th when Christine Lagarde started the whole issue by saying, we are not here to narrow your spreads. Obviously, that put a lot of pressure on periphery bonds. The Italian spread really going up. You can take a look at that, uh, and you can see that after when they hit the, that red circle there, that was when she said that, uh, and spreads went way up. They had a little success bringing it back down, but now they're blowing <coughs> out again, in part because of Holtzman's comments. Uh, not only did he suggest that she was right about the spreads, he also said that every crisis is a cleansing 
Reminds you of uh, in the Herbert Hoover days in the United States when they said we should purge the system of its rottenness. So now we see the, not just the statement from the ECB, but the ECB is in the markets through the Italian Central Bank buying up bonds to try to bring down that spread, try to cap yields at this point. And there's talk they might even go farther if they need to. Greek yields also rising and spreads widening in other countries on the back of these remarks. Mike McKee, great to catch up with you, sir. To Mike's point in the Italian bond market right now, yields up by 34 basis points on a two-year. The good news is that that is off session highs. The bad news is it's still up 34 basis points on a two-year. Tony Rodriguez, this is the last thing we need, isn't it? It's tough to get the toothpaste back into the tube, and the toothpaste came out on Thursday last week at the ECB. Yeah, it takes you twice as long to recover from a misstep than if you'd gotten it right the first time. <coughs> and, and I think that's where at least the Fed, I believe, is, is getting it right the on first the left time. Side. Dusting off programs from oh, the 08-09 right crisis. And they're recognizing that it's not really about the cost of money. It's zero, it's negative, it's low. It's about the availability of credit, the liquidity in the markets. So central banks are going to have to uh, use their balance sheet because right now <coughs> investors are de-risking. They need liquidity, and there's really no buyers on the other side. So that's where the uh, central banks globally are going to have to insert their balance sheets in order to provide that buyer on the other <coughs> side and allow markets to at least begin to clear, function a little bit better. We won't get back to fundamental value until we have a better sense of where is the crisis going to you know, peak out in terms of cases and fatalities. And once we see the true fiscal response addressing some of the demand destruction and supply chain disruption that's taking place affecting the real economy. Tony, we're at a really critical juncture for monetary policy. The good news last Thursday at the ECB is the decision was unanimous. The bad news, and President Lagarde has been asked repeatedly to say those words, those magic words from 2012 that President Draghi delivered, we'll do whatever it takes. Tony, do you think this Italian bond market, this bond market in Europe, in credit too, keeps pushing it until Christine Lagarde comes out and just says it? I think you're right. Whether she uses those exact terms or does it through more aggressive actions and slightly different you know, phrases, I think the market does want to see that central banks are all in and will do whatever <coughs> it takes. Uh, and in reality, they really have no alternative because they can't afford to see the markets completely freeze up. We've already got too many crises. We don't need another one, particularly out of Europe, and we certainly don't want to be talking about re-denomination risk in the months to come. Tony, stay close. I want to get to a Bank of America monthly fund manager survey coming out for the month of March, saying the following. The results revealing the biggest monthly drop in global growth expectations since the survey started in 1994 and the lowest global earnings expectations since the global financial crisis. I want to bring in Bank of America's Jared Woodard. He joins us. How now. do I get to Dad, a British pound? An aggressive reset of oh, the same one I'm looking at. You see what says watch yeah. list at the top right. Biggest drop in growth yeah. expectations. Type in uh, lowest ESPX GBP and JPY and I'll pop up. Ever, and the biggest collapse in equity allocation ever. Jared, when do you step in? <laughs> hey, John. It's, uh, it's definitely a survey that, that suggests you know, something that looks like, uh, you know, capitulation, at least at the level of, you know, institutional investors and, and asset managers. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a question of, um, oh, I think I hit my stop. Oh man. Collapse in, so in, uh, whack, in man. And what we can say is that in addition to all those records, I'm gonna take um, a break from trading gold, man. And it, and it at least, matter of you know, fact, I should have just had a higher stop, a small and, stop. And I'm in a small of a uh, yeah, lot size. Um, the, historically, that's been a moment in which, there's, you know, been more upside. Uh, oh, well, I'll make it back. And, and other risky assets, you know, than downside. Um, the caveat, of course, is that um, those trading models and indicators, you know, work work well in a, in a normal world. And this is clearly an abnormal situation. And so we have to take every quantitative measure with um, a healthy, you know, dose of, of, of salt, a truckload maybe. Um, uh, but it does, it does tell us that, you know, anyone who had been holding on, you know, um, you know, is no longer holding on in the way that they were. Joe, that's what I wanted to come to you on, whether levels matter in an environment like the one we're in right now. We had a break lower on cable, a clean break of 120, a clean break of 119, and at one point threatening to take out 118 as well. <coughs> this morning on Sterling, we have taken out the flash crash lows of October 2016. And Jared, as I saw cable break down, break down and break down again, I sat there asking myself, in a moment like this, whether levels matter in any way, shape or form, can you lean 
on any kind of historical valuation, any kind of support line for any of these com companies, for any of these securities, for any of these currencies. Can you, Jared? Well, here's, here's a link that I think does matter uh, between <coughs> you know, action in markets and, you know, our view on fundamentals, our view on macro and growth and so on. And that link is between uh, the, si the signal from markets <coughs> about what's, you know, priced in for the future and the response from policymakers. That's what matters. That's the only thing that matters here. And, and you've already seen this week, I think, a very meaningful shift um, out of Washington, D.C. Yeah, out everything's Europe, really been taken. Uh, um, yeah. Where policymakers who maybe were telling a very different story even a week ago are in coming forward with really aggressive stimulus, as, as you all are covering so well. I think the missing piece for markets on the stimulus front, we've seen, you know, $1.2 trillion mostly for consumers, plugging the hole for households. That's absolutely essential. You've seen aggressive Fed action to plug <coughs> any holes or, or provide liquidity in the, in the financial mm -hmm, system. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely necessary. All of those are necessary, but not, nece but not sufficient conditions for a macro rally. The one missing <coughs> piece is, is something that we wrote about in our, in our report this month uh, uh, for, for investors is – um, the credit system and, and, and especially small and medium companies. It's great if households have, you know, um, a check or benefits yeah. that can get them through this period. That doesn't give you revenue uh, for companies if everyone's stuck at home. And so that's why some of the policy measures that are, that are aimed at, at helping industry and Yo, even small talking, and medium pussy. businesses kind of I'm streaming. What else for me to say? Is, is, hasn't been done yet. If we can get that, that seems like the one missing piece that could give you a complete, you know, economic, I feel bad. I don't even you know, who the fuck uh, you are in your streaming. Like pause that uh, everyone can work with. Jared, I've got 10 seconds. It's a yes or no. So Markets good, can bro. stop panicking when policymakers start to panic. It's a famous line. Are they panicking? Yeah. Not how to make money. I'm just Jared Wood up there, panic. joining us from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch on the latest in this market. From New York City, the opening bat is up next. You play Here's Dota, bro? Bloomberg. Not even. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. Do you play Rust? I play like fuck all. I play like GTA and CSGO. Oh. I barely play video games. This game might get a fuck around. I gotcha. Did you like like find my Discord or you been here before? I was already in it. I was already in it. Oh. Like, what the fuck is this? Probably CSGO. Maybe CSGO, maybe. I used to play it though. It's been a long time since I played it. I don't know. Probably, wait, do you have a thing on Reddit? Uh, Discord on I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. I have a lot of people in my Discord, so I don't remember doing anything. <laughs> Man, I do got a lot of people. I just realized that. Yo, Kim, you got it all set up? Yeah. So, where are you setting your bars? So, basically... Your preferred boy. Okay, so, basically, um, I have this one set up at support level and resistance levels. You know what I mean? So, right here, you see how I tapped it twice and it come back up? Oh, I forgot you. I'm streaming, so you can't see in real time. So right here, you'll see it tapped it and come back up. And right here, you'll see it tapped it and it go back down. So this is what they call like the range area, you know, undecision, undecided. You know what I mean? And then once it breaks one direction, then it should keep going until a certain extent, at least. Okay, so then, you know how the your uh, your purple rectangles are like varying in width yeah so how do i make it smaller well no like why, why are one bigger than the other is there like a specific reason uh well no 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 i just got it i got it this one above like even though this one tapped here and that one tapped i did it to the highest tap you know what i mean and then what i did was mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't have to be that big Hold on, let me see. I think you're talking about this top one. Let me see. Sometimes I don't remember why I got it there. Hold on. So 
what are these purple ones indicate? Oh, like when you would want to buy it. Or yeah, or sell. I think I got this one here because of this right here. I, that's why I got this one here. So if you pull out the one hour chart, you'll see yeah. this right here being a support level. Yeah. Or it used to be, okay. even though that was like 20 hours ago, it's still the latest one. You know what I'm talking about? From New York City this morning. Good morning to you all. The opening bow just around the corner, 20 seconds away. Here's your price action. Equities over the last four days, brutal. Thursday, the biggest drop since 87. Friday, the biggest gain since 2008. Monday, the biggest drop since 87. Tuesday, up 6%. Wednesday, limit down since 1 a.m. Eastern time. And that is where we have been locked down. In the bond market, yields up a single basis point in a 10 year after a sell off for treasuries yesterday. A huge fiscal stimulus plan on the table your 10-year Treasury 1.08 percent in foreign exchange dollar strength it's been vicious this week cable breaking some key levels euro dollar south of 110 at 10926 and in the commodity market Wow have we got some big numbers for you or rather small numbers to be precise a 23 handle on WTI let's get to the market desk shall we and get you our reporters breaking down this price action Bloomberg's Kelly Lyons and Marie Horden and Taylor Riggs hey Kaylee Hey, John, once again, we find ourselves unable to hold on to any gains. After being limit down on futures since 1 a.m. Eastern time, right now, 9.30, the cash open, we open lower by 5.5% on the S&P 500, very close to undoing all of yesterday's gains. We're down about 6% on the Dow, 55 on the NASDAQ. Of course, John will have to watch to see if these losses steepen, because if we do see a decline of 7%, that will trigger a market-wide circuit breaker, and we'll halt trading for 15 minutes. We're not there yet, but we're relatively close to those levels. Now, as for some individual equity movers. Let's take a look at some stocks moving lower on the back of earnings, one of which is FedEx, which did beat in the third quarter, but withdrew its guidance because of the impact of the virus. That stock down about two and a half percent here at the open. General Mills down by three and a half percent. Again, virus is a large uncertainty. Tencent missed on profit before the virus even hit. That stock down by 6.3 percent. And finally, John Apple down the better part of four percent. Dan Ives over at Wedbush cutting his price target by $65, saying the virus means there are dark days ahead for the company, John. Kelly Lyons, thank you very much. Just a little bit of a silver lining there with FedEx. As they say, China is rebounding just a little bit more quickly than anticipated. See, you still looking at my stream very briefly with a 23 handle but uh, yeah on i was uh, and i was feeling up world, to follow what they don't say and uglier yeah john it is astonishing what we're yeah. seeing in these oil prices as you say wti hitting $23 a barrel. Brent, we're seeing also lows we haven't seen in years. The Saudis have given a direct. All right. So remember, I told you every time I trade, I, 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 tap, I, I, I make two positions in one trade. And behind closed doors, I was told his. I didn't do that. I didn't do that for gold, though. I did. I just did it for. Uh, I didn't do it for gold, though. Because gold is more expensive. So when it crosses this line, all right. All right, all right. And then prices so are if you go here President Putin, and you go here, do not like these prices. Mizuho Security says we can go to negative. Let's John, see. can you imagine Luke Oil or Ramco having to pay you to buy their barrel of oil? I want to take a look what's going on the travel sector. Oh, matter of fact, right click the Forex chart and then click one quick trade in. That's again, what I mean. another That's what brutal do. day. No one is traveling for business or leisure. United cutting schedules again. International 85%, domestic 45%. Carnival down more than 11%. We know they are needing financing. Marriott as well. They are furloughing some of one their employees. Trade. They have 130,000 employees, John. We know U.S. hotels, they say $1.4 billion a week. That's how much they're losing. And then finally, MGM Resorts down more than 7%. Basically, essentially, as we know it, Sin City is closing their doors. The Nevada government says the casinos have to close today, starting at midnight for the next 30 days. Okay, what do I do and now some country? of the biggest capitalists want a hand handout, don't they? They want a bailout. Amory, before you go, just a quick question on commodities and crude. How close are we to breaching some storages out in the Middle East, out here in the United States as well? Just how close are we to some of those critical levels? We are incredibly close. Everyone, Vito, Traffic Girl, you see all the traders loading up. That's where people are looking for right now. They want to know where they can get more storage, hoard these crude oil at these record low prices. We also know the U.S. government is looking up to put in their oil into strategic reserve. And that's where Mizuho Security said we can go into negative barrels. Maybe uh, negative prices on this. Maybe you said what? I couldn't hear you. Exactly negative prices. <clears throat> But uh, what clearly, do I do after one click trading? Say, um, do you see those two bars at the top of your screen? One says buy, one says sell. The chains probably looking like single single digits uh, what, is an option on the table. Uh, Jonathan, this price at the top left, you should see what says sell and buy. Serious. 
and they are the one that are invoking some serious damage right now in the market. Amory, good to see you. Thank you. Four minutes into this. If you look at my stream, you'll see it right here. If you watch me on YouTube, it's much more live than on Facebook. Little better compared to what we had seen overnight and on the Spider S&P 500 ETF just before the cash open. Looking at some of the sectors out there. A big focus on pretty much everything I know, but a special focus on retail right here, right now with Taylor Riggs. Hey, Taylor. And particularly sad for some of the job losses that are going to be inevitable for this uh, for this sector, John. Uh, we got a little hint of this yesterday when retail sales were weaker than expected for February, and that was really before some of the mass lockdowns really started to take effect in March. As we know, we'll start to get a big divergence between internet and brick and mortar, but for now, brick okay. and mortar bearing the brunt. You see right at the top uh, left where it says buy and sell. 29 million Americans, 3.6 million stores. So Amazon hiring 100,000 people is great, okay. but not going to solve the problems of Macy's, Bloomingdale's the like, oh, yeah, yeah. all uh, shutting down for Yeah, the so basically that's when you're making your bet that one is going to go up or go down. Price action. This is a weekly okay, number. I do not, not see that on one. You're down 30 Hold on. 50%. So if you right you click, you see where it says one click trading, click that. There's some box pop up where you got to agree. Yes. Gap. Yeah. Okay, yes, I see it. Gap uh this morning also announcing new score store closures across the country effective tomorrow taylor ricks thank you let's keep it on retail and what is this like uh, joining us now, key bank managing director joining us uh, on the phone. Well, he said again too for you I can hear you. what you see in the retail complex right now this, okay so yours is that five cents yeah because i got real money in there though you got demos but yeah sure pay that 0.05 that'd be it'd be much more realistic you know we saw obviously the flurry of okay. closures that started friday um, how do you create a, uh, but given the uncertainty uh, right now, a soften uh, to think that this may be or a buy-in and so forth? I'll show you that in a second. Are you talking about um, a stop loss? Yeah. I'll show you that. I'll show you that. So basically, I'll show you that in this, in, when, when we so make a trade. We, we call it creative <clears> players, right? Obviously, okay. first Amazon, um, you know, you've seen them really shift the focus. So on you see how it's right here, right? Uh, and medical equipment. You know, we've been, uh, um, if it, yeah, if it goes above the purple line, I'm looking to buy. If it goes below this purple line, I'm looking to sell. But when I click buy or sell, I'm going to click it twice. That way I have two trades in. You know what I mean? The first one, I'm going to take out at 10 pips. And the second one, I'm going to show you how to do that, though. The second one, I'm going to take out probably right here or up here. Depends on how it goes. And then if it goes down... That's what I'm trying to set up right now. If it goes down, how far to go? So I got to, I pulled. That's why I pulled up the hour chart. Let me see the four hour chart. Uh, hold on. Okay, there we go. The daily chart. Let's see. Um, you know, malls having difficulty, and we've seen a lot of Walking Dead retailers. I think this is going to precipitate some of that. I think we'll see significant and accelerated store closures, and I think you're going to see, you know, finally this rationalization, which has been going on for 10 years, really accelerate. Ejiruma, great to get your thoughts on a program this morning. Let's continue the conversation on equities with Eden Barnes, portfolio manager. Yana Barden joins us now on the phone. Yana, great to have you with us on the program. <laughs> I want to start by talking about valuations and whether valuations actually matter in an environment like this one when no one knows what the east side of the equation looks like. What do you tell people when they ask you that question? Okay, so and let me see if I got this right. always matters, and I think this is when you lean back on the numbers that are already on the books. Um, as a large-cap growth manager, our job is to be invested in the market, not time the market, <clears> and find the best opportunities as we sit here today. And I think uh, the key point that I would make is we are bullish in the long term. Would you set up a buy at 127.875 and then a sell at 128.63? But the average stock is down greater than 20 so what we're seeing yeah, actually, I'm going to send it to you on, 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 on CPM, but it's a little easier. Meaning opportunities for active stock pickers is also expanding. So valuations always matter, particularly now. Well, Yana, let's talk about things at the index level first. I mentioned on this program yesterday that JP Morgan pointed out that in the last three recessions, last three recessions, PE multiples track 10.1, 13.8, and 10.2. If you're going to use realized earnings as a guide, looking back on where valuations are right now is there more space for re-rating lower still probably on the index level and this is why no, let's see right now that's easier really for me to do this so long. Because you've had a significant sell-off um asymmetric sell-off and a more so you say you want to do a sell uh, 
discretionary than you might have had uh, maybe on the more stable areas of the market. But one has to uh, make an assumption, and this is where the probabilities really matter, that we will see earnings recession given the economic. Okay, so you way up there. All right, so you see this red line right here? Recession of 15 to 16 percent, which is exactly what we what are like? The one right here, this is the active price right here. Recession red line right Right here. Then we 127. I'm on. I'm on yeah, trading view. I, I don't see that on my screen, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Exactly this is where it's at. So you want to make a judgment based off of this. You know what I mean? So, um, you up here. You say 128.630. That's way up here. You know what I mean? So, and you say a uh, uh, buy at 127. I just want to bring my audience some breaking news. The equity market just rolling over just a touch here. We're down five and a half percent. Kelly Lines has some breaking news. Hey, Kelly. That's 630. News from President Trump tweeting that he is temporarily Oh, I see the line on my screen now. Okay. Yeah. says that this is a mutual consent decision, but that northern border. Okay, so you're looking for more immediate trades. So you're constantly following that line, correct? Not, well, not a, yeah. Yeah, I am constantly following that line, but. Really, I'm just waiting on it to pass my support level or resistance level. I'm going to tell you about that. Like, every time you get here, it goes down. Every time I get down here, it goes up. So I'm waiting on it to break either or. So if it breaks down, I'm going to do a sell. If it breaks up, I'm going to do a buy. Uh, I see what you're saying. Okay. To go in for single you, so you're just looking for those tiny increases? Start to move back into this uh, to, yeah, I wanted to pass this purple bar. You know what I mean? Is there a particular yeah. headline, Yana? So you're setting it up at a low. Mm hmm And a high. Input and a high. I think, uh, and how come you didn't set it up at that one you're at right now? Of the coronavirus. Oh, I guess I could. I mean, so cool. sure, I could. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, is it just like a, a more like a, a riskier move to do it? Yeah, like that's it? why. Because, like, think about it. Okay. If I, if it, if I put the purple bar here, right? Uh, and, and and I press buy. It possibly could go up, but it go up here. That's not enough to make a move. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You don't want it to go up just to a, another high. I mean, it's gonna go up. Normally, it goes up to another high. And you don't want it to go up like three pips. That's a waste of time. How many pips is a uh, through 2019 when S and P 500 registered positive returns? We saw several world wars. We saw several pandemics. Uh, this is different, but if you are taking the long-term view, and this is the most important thing, what is your investment horizon? Over time, S and P 500 has realized profits over one five and ten-year period, and then when you take it longer, just, five years. How do I long, change my uh? To 90 percent. So this is the my meta trader am i making this to uh for the next three months or for the next one the british to japanese yeah. i think right now you gotta lean on the meta trader longer yeah oh, hold on hold on let me see what this about to do oh never mind i got it again great to catch up with you to get your thoughts hold on again on the equity market your stock market right now down by 4.9 percent on the s p 500 up next on this program wang in on the U.S. economy and the next move for monetary policy, PIMCO's <laughs> Tiffany Wilding. That's next right here live on Bloomberg TV. Okay. I, might, I might wait till it crossed this line right here, actually, to make this trade. <clears throat> So this is where it stopped last time, so I want to wait until it crossed that line if I make that trade. Oh man! Wait, so with one click, buy and sell? It happens instantly. Click, click. How much bon bonus money they give you? Ten thousand. Yeah, so you can um do like a practice trip. Just click it once. So you can see what I'm talking about, and then you'll see what. And then, how do you set up a, uh, a stop loss? So when you click when when you click on buy or sell or whatever, um, it's gonna show a bar where you bought or sell at, and then um, so if you say, remember I say if you click sell, 
dad is expecting hold on hold on just look you see this right here look 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 okay uh Let's see. Right. I waiting on it to cross that blue line. Only because it tapped it last time and it didn't do nothing. I'm going to click it twice as soon as it passed the blue line. Come on. Wait, man. so you can buy from... No, I'm okay. using MetaTrader. I got it on my other screen. Okay. The Open. I'm Renita Young here in the principal room. Coming up, former U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers. And you can't set up a buy like at a certain manager. Uh, I mean, you can. You can do that too. Down by a little more than five percent to peel things back just a little bit. And get you up to speed on the second how would you do that um so you you mean like do you want to do it where it get to a certain point or do you want to just yeah like if, if it hits a certain time like it buys in and then it sells at a certain so time. when you right click and then uh you can do it just click buy stop that's how you do okay, i just pulled up your thing what did i do you click on buy stop down 8.3 percent after having their best and then it'll set it up like for example if i right click here i click buy stop just to see this line right here if it crossed that line it's going to do a buy trade and you can move it too chart of the S&P 500 energy sector it has lost more than half its value okay. in the past month John as WTI hits $23 a barrel John Kelly lines thank and you and buy stop means that it buys at that there, time right it buys at that once they hit that line last week okay on this show, right. we talked about that cliche that line that gets thrown around in okay. the crisis That's okay. markets can stop panicking when policymakers start to panic markets can stop panicking when policymakers start to panic arguably what you've seen over the last week is monetary policy makers start to panic and you're watching bloomberg what guess in the last couple of days that perhaps uh, bloomberg news that's the uh oh wait i can watch the um america one now it's 9 30. let me just pull it up on that and please to say a good friend of the show joins us on the phone terry haynes pangea policy so i think this might be the yahoo fan Now you're watching Yahoo? Yeah, now I'm watching Yahoo Finance. Yeah. I watched the Bloomberg one when the Yahoo one ain't open. Okay. Because, uh... Remember, the New York Stock Exchange opens at 9.30 Eastern Standard. Remember? Okay. That's why the Yahoo one ain't open. I mean, but it's 9.30 now, so. Yeah, so um, the airlines are asking for more than $50 billion. And it looks to us like a significant portion of that is going to be payroll. Um, you know, the airlines are losing billions of dollars every day because the number of people who are canceling their trips exceeds the number of people who are booking new trips, even at these very low fares. And that obviously is unsustainable. As the airlines cancel, um, most airlines are refunding money and people aren't, you know, that quick to rebook. Um, as a result, more cash is coming out the door. The airlines are doing everything they can. By See, I got two cell stops set up. Capacity, going to their suppliers, asking for relief. I got like fucking four OEM, screens. Hold on. Asking not to pay pre-delivery deposits on aircraft. Where are you? Preferring delivery of aircraft and so on. So they're doing everything they can to conserve capital as well as taking down their revolvers and looking for additional sources of capital. 
Um, and obviously, this is much worse than 9-11, because in 9-11, people were concerned about flying, but they flew. In this situation, nobody's going anywhere. Um, you know, I think you might have read in one of my notes, I said a couple of weeks ago, you can't stop the world. But apparently, you can stop the world, and that's exactly what's going on here as borders are closed and so on. Helene, uh, how worried are you about, let's say, some of the major airlines, or Delta and American, even United, simply running out of cash within the next two months? Yep. Um, if you'd asked me that question a month ago or three weeks ago, I would have said, no, these guys have staying power. Um, at this point, we're very concerned about it. We think, you know, it may be sooner than two months that they run out of cash as they continue to um, pay their employees. What they can about not furloughing um, anybody. American was very um, actually impressive. They reached an agreement very rapidly on um, with their pilots on on um, things like leave United as well. Delta also leave um, you know taking leave in this short term, taking longer term leave. Um, we have something on the order of we estimate it's it's about over the next decade about 23,000 pilots and American Delta and United are going to retire. Um, there are a lot of pilots that are over the age of 60, and the airlines are saying, if you were going to retire this year, retire now. If you were thinking about retiring in the next year or two, maybe retire now. They're um, offering to continue to pay through the time the pilots turn 65. So they're doing everything they can to help their employees get through the next couple of months. But you know, without exogenous health, they're going to run out of cash. How do you they're make that tiny news screen? Months, <laughs> Andy, On my you know, stream? Yeah. Um, I got two monitors. So I just pulled up YouTube. Um, we're going to see some of these major and, uh, carriers yeah. be forced to uh, merge uh, just simply just to stay alive. And who do you think those candidates might be? Who do you see perhaps getting together either during this pandemic or when we come out the other side of it? I would imagine the airline industry is going to be smaller than we know it to be today. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question specifically because most of the airlines from a justice perspective are too big to like merge with each other. And I think there are a lot of people around who would object to like American and United merging, for an example, or, you know, Delta and American merging, something like that. There, you would see huge objections. So I don't think you're going to see mergers at that level. I think you're going to see it at the lower levels, the regional level. We already had trans states, which was going out of business at the end of the year, accelerate that to April 1st. Um, you know, I think you're seeing it in the level of like Spirit, Frontier, Allegiant, Alaska, JetBlue. Those are the category. That's the category where we think mergers <coughs> make more sense than among you know, American, Delta, and United. Um, but we could see, you know, bankruptcies. I hate to use the B word because it's so, you know, there's nothing that would, in, in, the, in the last writ phase of consolidation, the reason you had bankruptcies was to get out of older, unattractive equipment. Now, most of the airlines have relatively young, fuel-efficient fleets. And um, it's just surviving the next, say, four to eight weeks to get to um, the other side when when um, this abates, if it does, which we're assuming it abates as the weather warms up. Oh, I forgot you can't work. You, you're not working from home or nothing? And go somewhere. And, you know, we yeah. think there will be some yeah. pent-up demand. When you're going to work. Um, it's already happening in China. Well, no. Uh, since know, I'm in the solar industry, I work when I have uh, meetings with clients. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. There were 15,000 flights in China the beginning of January. And that fell so a good, to, um, damn, I set it up right. I should have done it. February, and it was back to 10 I had 127, uh, so 181. Oh, you're talking about that, that buy, that buy order? Yeah, I should have done it. The markets continue to be in free fall. The S&P 500 down about 4.7% down. The Dow is down more than 5 for Sandy. Another stunning session here. Yeah, and you know, people, I think. So, are we watching S and P now? Um, no, I'm not. Oh, oh no, the news. That's what he got. No, no, that's not S and P. Actually, he's talking about it. President Trump is announcing he's closing the border with Canada uh, to all non-essential traffic. 
And, you know, of course, that's bad news, our oldest ally. But, you know, of course, then there's ambiguity with that, Brian. What exactly does that mean? I mean, one would imagine that food, for instance, and military and government personnel can cross back and forth. But can family members who are on the other side return home? And those are the kinds of questions with every one of these kind of pronouncements that leads to more uncertainty. And the oldest saw in the book is the markets hate that. So contributing to our situation right now, Brian. Uh, and, and Jared, over to you. Uh, look, we just had Helene on air talking about potential airline bankruptcies. I was looking on the, on the Yahoo Finance trending ticker page, Boeing getting slammed, airlines getting slammed. This hasn't been a one day decline. This has been going on for about a month. Yeah, as you can see right now, Microsoft uh, pressure, uh, in addition to a lot of the airlines, but make no mistake about it, the uh, the broader uh, overall Dow, the markets continue to be under severe pressure. Now you have an S&P 500 market multiple of around 12 times. You'd think that was, would be cheap, Andy, but no go. Yeah, and, and I think that's absolutely right, Brian. And just one more point about the airlines that I think is worth making that we didn't get to with the lane, but a lot of people are calling for uh, a potential investment by the government in the airlines. In other words, that they don't just get a straight bailout package, but if the government does put in, say, $50 billion, which I know the airlines were looking for earlier, that may be too low by now, that the government takes a stake in these companies, not unlike the automakers going back to 2008, 2009, or that the ordinary uh, investors not get diluted. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about the mechanisms of bailouts, but I think the real key is that President Trump is going to have to take a page from Franklin Delano Roosevelt's book, which is not in his metabolism. <coughs> to get money directly into the hands of consumers, big fiscal stimulus, and I think that's what's really going to. That's a slippery slope. What's up? If they allow uh, uh, government to have a stake in a company. Mm -hmm. In 45 seconds, uh, you've come out uh, already. 17,000 might be in the cards. What's your sense on the market on a session like this? Maybe a steak with We're a buyout. Today. I think uh, that would be fair. Yesterday, my key support level was 20,000 on the Dow. Um, Damn, I would have had my first, uh, my first one. Right <laughs> uh, we came under there. <laughs> Fuck. Okay, I, I, I understand how to get in and get out now. Mm -hmm. And, and on the cash these market, trends, I just need to keep right looking at them more. Yeah, but um, as a scalper, it's more about the now moment, not the, the trend a little bit. You know what I mean? It does matter. But all you want is 10 pips at the minimum, you know what I mean? And how much a pip is what? Depending on your lot size, remember? If you got 0 0.05, 50 cents per pip. All right, James McDonald, always appreciate your, your honesty here. Good luck in these markets. James McDonald, always good to see you. Andy Sower. Because, uh, you know, remember now, I'm, using, I'm only using 50 cents because, you know, I'm still learning to be consistent. But, of course... You know, when you start being consistent. Wait, and a pip is 0 0.001 or 0 0.01? Uh, I believe it's 0 0.01 or either 0 0.001. Either or. Hold on, let me see. It's one of them. My name is Paul Mantilli. And as a citizen of the United States of America. I believe it's 0 0.001. I proudly fly the stars and stripes in my front yard. Uh, point, yeah, point zero one. Anthem, and pledge allegiance to the flag. And I am grateful, so grateful, for the visionaries who've truly made this nation a beacon of democracy so that my family so then, can pursue the American dream. Today, I'm returning the favor by issuing an urgent message for my fellow Americans. Okay, so teach me these conversions. So at five cents, mm -hmm. each pip should be five cents, no? If it's point zero five, it's 50 cents. You know what I'm talking about? So just add it a zero in front of the number, or you know what I'm talking about? Move it. How, how come it's 50 cents? Because the point zero five is, is the lot size, you know what I mean? But it's, but it's really 50 cents. I'm not sure why, but that's just how it is. Like if you do point zero one, <laughs> that's that's ten cents. Okay. Yeah. So then, what if you increase it to point one? 
then that'd be a dollar per pill. Okay. All right. So point one is the dollar. Mm -hmm. okay, and if you have a lot size of one, that's ten dollars per pill. You know what I mean? So like, once you start getting confident in your trades, then you can start doing a dollar and ten dollars per pill, and that's when the money really start kicking in. Cause remember, remember what I told you. You get um. Because you got people that are doing seven and all of that. You know what I mean? That's $70 per, per trip. So just imagine, remember I told you people do two trades, one of them that get the 10 pips, another one they just leave running. So imagine, so if you get 10 pips off the rip, that's about uh, $700 right there. You know what I'm talking about? And then if you leave the other one running, obviously at the minimum it's at 700 on the second one. And it's only going to keep going up. You know what I mean? I'm just yeah. getting better at knowing when to trade. That's what I'm working on right now. But when, when I get better at knowing when to say yes or no, then I can start increasing my numbers. But until then, I'm just training myself to get that good. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Yahoo Finance. As you can see, this is not our normal I'm going to put it at point one. It's that it is still very important yeah, that we better do deal with this pandemic. Well, it's a fake one, but... So yeah, but you can get an idea of what's going on, though. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. information we're wanting to still communicate with you and let you know what's going on especially with these wild markets and today is no different uh we opened up down about six percent on the, the major indexes the dow jones industrial average now down about a thousand points it was off about six percent earlier down just about four and three quarters of a percent now Taking a look at the broader market, we've got the S&P 500 down 4%. We've got the NASDAQ off about 3%. We saw that nice rally late yesterday when uh, the Trump administration came out and said it was looking at a trillion dollar fiscal stimulus package for this economy, including getting actual checks to Americans as soon as possible. I think giving us checks is still a bad idea. All this extra money, all that's a bad idea. A bailout package for the you know, I mean, there's a reason why they say mm -hmm. there's a reason why they say have six months of um, emergency money available. There's a reason behind that. And this is the reason. And if you didn't have six months of emergency money, then that's you. You should have had six months of emergency. Now, if you had six months of emergency and then it still didn't play out right, then then that's when you can say, all right, this, this stuff isn't getting taken care of. We need something, to be, you know, something needs to be done. You know, th that's the reason behind them having six months of emergency money behind. That's that's just the reason, you know. I'm like I like I had I got I'm only 27. I got years of emergency money sitting around. You know how long I've been sitting around playing Dota. You 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 know how every matter of fact. When did I meet you? Like January. Absolutely, Alexis. As you mentioned, more than two hundred thousand. Think so. Or December, probably before that. I don't even know. Yeah, I think it was November. Yeah, and since I met since you met me, I've been sitting home playing game all day. That means that's that, that's my emergency money I'm cutting into. Okay, I think I bought in, but. What, what, do I, what would it show me if I did? If you look at the bottom, you'll see some numbers moving. With what we saw in Italy, what so nothing's moving. So does that mean I didn't do it? No. If you look at the bottom right here on my stream, you'll see where it says profit, negative or positive. The world is basically on lockdown in some cases. We know that we've okay, seen where? You know, a lot in Europe. Right there. Okay. So nothing pops up. <laughs> Playing into really what a lot of by. investors and analysts are looking at right now. We know that this morning, Deutsche Bank said that there will be a slow or a slowdown in the first half of 2020. Which, if you remember, just a month ago, we thought this was going to be a first quarter hit, not not beyond that. And so it's really interesting to see that play out. Meanwhile, hospitals are gearing up for exactly what we're seeing in Italy, which is just a surge. Even though we, as we are practicing social distancing, and other companies are also shutting. Dude, yeah, I don't. I think I'm doing this wrong. <laughs> what happened, bro? Could be, in fact, Did you, you know how that? Like the, I, I, I clicked buy like three times and like nothing's happening. You didn't hear that thing go pop, pop, or whatever? Respirators and yeah, I did. Ventilators that they know that they're gonna Can you share your screen on uh, Discord? Own hands to craft, how do I do that? Uh, so at the bottom left of your screen, you don't see where it says um, go live, right? Where it says voice connected. Yesterday that they were going to be donating ventilators and masks. Um, voice connect? The, okay. Uh, uh, go live. That also just came in. Uh, so really, just waiting to see how this all plays oh, out. We know that as testing ramps up in the next couple of days and in the next couple of weeks, we're really going to get a much clearer picture of what is going on in the country. Okay, there we go. 
All right, I want to get Keith Bliss in here now with IQ Capital. And Keith, if you pick an asset this morning, it is down. I don't care what you're looking at. Stocks, bonds. I bought it. I heard the noise. Bonds. All right, let me see. I'm looking at your Assets thing right now. You didn't buy nothing, man. Of chaos. Everything is just sort of getting thrown out. Um, the, the baby with the bathwater. All right, so right click on your um chart. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to show you something real quick. So go, go to properties. Opportunity right Where's now. that? And right click again on the chart. To be just click on properties at the bottom. Cash and sit on it. Well, thank you, Alexis. We're hearing a couple of the different things from our calls at the institutional clients and hedge funds. Okay. And people that are trading. Wait, did something pop up on your screen? I can't. I don't know if it popped up on your other monitor. Yeah. Can you drag it? Because I can't see it. Volatility that you've seen really since February twenty. What do you mean, drag it? Did, when you right click on uh, right click again. Unless they're mutual no, I did. So something propped up the uh, under properties. What do I do? Well, I don't see it. That's what I'm saying. Is it on your other monitor? Right. When we see every yeah, it is. Can you drag it to this one? That's what I'm saying. Because I can't see it. Oh no, no, it's not on another monitor. It just popped up on a different window. Uh, what, what, which window? I can't see. I see like bar chart, candlesticks, line chart. Can you drag it to the screen? Because I can't see it at all. That's what I'm saying. I can't see nothing. Like we saw with the global financial crisis, where they're starting to pull out. My personal opinion. I'm gonna turn off this news guy. Thing you want to do at this point in time. My work and my quantitative models have shown that the markets have been vastly, vastly oversold since the end of February, and should bounce back. You know, anywhere from thirty. Oh, so stream ended. Trading days. So. Uh, I know I have to pull up the new thing. Uh, what we uh, call total capitulation, not just from the equity see if you can see it now. equity investors, but everybody who's looking to raise cash. The other, the other uh, aspect of this uh, that we've observed and we and we certainly verified. Yeah, you still can't see it. Is, but you uh, see the property window, though, right? Quick yeah, I do. All right, my, okay. So I'll just tell you what to do then. A lot of so let's see. Right click properties. Call. Okay. So you see where it says. Cash wherever you can. So that's why we saw the odd. The odd uh, comparison. Uh, let's say. Gold pulling back, bond selling off. You know. Go to matter of fact, if you look at my stream, we're gonna click on. Um, so, um, given that, we're gonna have to let this. Uh, just I could just tell you what to do. So click on colors. Uh, there will be a point where we get a bid in the okay. market. And then background black. Uh, given okay. The, given the value, um, uh, conditions. Bull candle green. All right, I am looking at. Um, our trending tickers here and it's it's like not any right. green whatever yeah because we've got boeing uh, the top trending name right now on the uh, yahoo okay. finance site this bear is candle another red another 15 percent or uh, yeah 15 percent uh this morning alone tesla hard to believe okay. we're talking about click tesla on now, so common share not long ago it's, it's there's a common tab four hundred dollars a share when I look at what is actually green, and there's not a lot of oh, that going oh, okay. on. Okay, okay. So uncheck show grid. I bio is higher right now uh, by about. Uh, and then click show X line. Uh, we've okay. also got Bio America up 16%. Uncheck show grid. There's no show grid. So you're seeing a clear at the, here. You see on my screen where at the bottom right where it says uh, show OHLC, show X line. To treat and ultimately cure coronavirus. Um, what are you keeping on the common on in the comments tab? You're always down at the New York Stock Exchange floor. floor at this time. I know the floor is open. Traders are still there. Of course, Yahoo Finance now working from home. Um, but what are you keeping an eye yeah, you on? Into colors. If you were indeed on the floor of the Stock Exchange today. Yeah, so my yeah, commenting does not have the option zero set. Just mentioned Boeing actually trading at around levels uh, of 2013. Uh, when we closed on Boeing yesterday, uh, it was down 55%. For the All right. This so right click alone. again so on your screen. Let me see if I can see your screen. Okay. Click on. Oh, did you did you click on OK? Like oh, click OK on the properties thing, so I can save. Oh, okay. Where were the colors again? Uh, a bearish candle is red. Boeing has not just the problem of the max, but of course with the airlines that have and a bullish candle is green with uh, their capacity that's down Bull uh, candle just green yeah people just not traveling all of that coming to a halt that and then background is black with order deferrals and, and is black. payments mm -hmm. coming to the company so uh, Boeing is what okay. an example of is sort of the broader scope of the uh, airline industry company. all right now click on let's see what says grid go up some go up some down 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 right there up oh great huh? stocks, boom in the 
That's how mines look. So I, you're looking at it. Go to the 15 minute chart. Top left. M15. M15. Down a little bit. Left. All right. So that, that's what I'm looking at right now. Okay. So when you buy, it should show up right here, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So I clicked buy like a few times and it didn't do anything. Let's see. Click it. Going to be enough for some of these airlines to remain flying. Right. They're, they're, they've been burning through. Capital. So click on journal at the bottom right. Oh, shoot. It hit my own limit, did it? 50% you have. Oh, no. That's something else. All right. Click on. You see at the bottom right. Right. Go to the right a little bit more. You see where it says. Go to the right. It's like a tab on the, on the two bar. I can't see where your mouse is at. Oh, go up a little bit. Go to the left. Which is their busiest month. Go down. 1.5 go to the right so uh, write some more some a little bit more right there click journal as well. now click uh, this click it again try click buy again and see what she happens said it yesterday the treasury secretary okay. their impact is going to be instant buy 9 11. All right, everybody, we oh, want to stay in. with us and be patient with us as we continue to bring this in some I don't know. information from I don't know why it's doing homes. that. We're going to take a quick break. Let's we'll see. Right Click on where it says, I'll go to the left where it says trade. Should I press sell and see what happens? Yeah, just see what happens. I'm not sure. You see at the bottom right where it says start? Mine didn't say start, but click go, go, click that and see what happens. That might be. I don't even know what that is, by the way. I'm just trying to see. Oh, just click stop. Um, that's something else, probably. Okay. I'm not sure what's going on. Let's see. Let me think. Um, maybe try to change the lot size to like one or something like that, just to see what happens. Okay, do I buy again? Yeah, just try it. See what I mean. I'm not sure. Click it again. It says we quote instant buy at 16. Try this right here. Click on new order at the top. Go up, like directly up. Go to the right. Click that. New order. And something popped up? Yeah. Oh, man. I forgot I can't see if something popped up. Hold on. Let me, let me pull it up on my screen then. Sure. Press buy and sell there. Try that and see what happens. Do like sell by market or something like that and just see what happens. Same thing? Oh, okay. It says, do you accept these new quotes? Click it. Now go to journals. Okay. So, okay. So, yeah. I have to do a quick. Okay, so buy, accept. Okay, that sounded like it did it. But I'm not sure why you had to do it. Maybe because you didn't want to kind of trying to help you or something. Oh, it's right here. It's right here. So it's showing losses. Okay. Mm -hmm. So from here, I can press sell, right? Try it. See if it works. Okay. Let me see if that passes even so I don't just... Welcome back. Well, okay, wait, hold on. Sell is when you think it's going to go down. If you want to take your money, go to the bottom right of the screen. So sell limit. That's, that's when you're setting up a, a, a plan for later. So if, to take your profits, if that's what you're talking about, at the bottom right, you see that go all the way to the right, like directly to the right. You see that X right beside your um thing? That's how you take your money, yeah. But obviously that's negative, so with us right now on uh, mm -hmm. beautiful meets and Keith I want to talk to you about but you remember when I was trading view when I was telling you about that range that we waiting on to break that range yeah and you bought it in that you you, you put in an order during that range that's why you're gonna be stuck in the middle for a while and they are saying you know what I'm talking about the mm -hmm. US Federal Reserve yeah, yeah. should ask Congress for power to buy investment grade corporate so okay so from here how would I set up a, a like a sell point federal reserves including all right so can do right click on the screen think that that makes sense click on sell limit like this and really I guess the underlying question okay. is is there anything you see that that line right there can really do go up right a little bit to move the up some more market. 
That's the other order up some more. That line, drag that to where you want it to be at. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm keep coming down, down some more. I've agreed by the way. All the way down, all the way down, 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 down some more. Down some more. Right below that tallest one. A little bit below that tallest one. Yeah. Oh man, you probably, probably drag it off the screen, I think. We've retained those. Uh, we we kept using them for years. They're they're substantial. They're ample. They're usable. They're usable. There's this thing. That's the uh, that's the that's, that's the order. Yes. While Try dragging it down a little bit. Hold on. Not that one. No. Oh yeah. Let me show you how to do the stop loss. So if you click that one, that's the first order that you really made. Not that right there. So you just you drag it, left click it, and drag. It. So since you're doing a buy, you think it's gonna go up. So if you drag it up, it's gonna be like a take profit. If you drag it down, it's gonna be a stop loss. You know what I'm saying? Control. And if that means okay. giving them the authority to buy um, uh, corporate debt. So what, what do I do with this? So you're in profit right now, actually. You can take that money if you want, or you can just set it to take profit. If that's going to provide liquidity. Okay, so what, what, what is this very thing that I'm dragging? So that's, okay, so if it hit that mark, it's going to take the money automatically. That's what it's doing. So let's say you, you set it right there where you at right now. Let go. Massive repos are going to be doing. Uh -huh. Let go that right there. And you went to the bathroom and you came back and it hit that. It's going to take the money for you. Instead of you having to do it okay. by yourself. Uh, so are there always two lines here? No, that's the one that you placed. Remember, we didn't set that up yet. This one? Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to show you. So if you look to the bottom right of your screen, you see how you're already in profit? Yeah. If you click that X, you can take the money. You know what I mean? I'm just showing you that, you know? Yeah. So, you might not understand what that yeah. is and why the Fed moved to do that. Can you give us a quick explainer? Sure. Um, the um, commercial paper, it's interesting too, why that they, mm -hmm. they really needed to add. But yeah, so that, that top line, that very first line at the top of it, just messing with yes, all spreads are the one above that, the green one above that, the first green one, that's the order that you. Okay, wait, why are there three? Okay, so the very, very first one was the one that you were saying how do you set up an order to hit automatically when you get there. That's the first one. Okay, so if I don't want this, what do I do? That one, you is, there is no I don't want this. That's the one that you bought, remember? That's the trade that's actually going on right now. Oh, that's where I bought it at. Yeah. Okay, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. The TP, you see where it says TP? Yeah, you see where it says TP? That means take profit. That means when it hit that red line, it's going to automatically take the profit. That's what that means. Okay, and then what is this? Uh, that's a pending order. So that's what I was trying to help you set up. So if you drag it down below, see, that's like a sell order right there. So if you drag it down below the green, it goes down all. Go down some more. Let go. I'm not sure why. Sometimes you got to do it slow or something. Hold on one second. Let me try to get in the trade. And I can't delete this one, right? Hold on one. It's a sell limit. Overnight finance for corporations that need it for trade finance and need it for just financing their day to day activities. One second. Hold on. Regulatory failing. They can't fix it now. They just have to provide the backstop. But the backstop right now, as it stands, is insufficient in as much as they backstopped it at 200 basis points or 2% over that funding rate. That's too wide. It's trading at 107 or 8 or something this morning. They need to tighten that up considerably to make that actually flow. So, you know, I agree with Keith's general uh, thesis that things are you know, that all of these programs are important and they need to step in and get involved, but they need to, they need to be a little more precise with some of these as well. What's up, James? I see you nodding. <laughs> what train software do you use? Um, MetaTrader 4. I'm just trying to help my buddy set his I, one up. I do, as I agree all right, so where was we at real quick? I was looking at my own chart. The commercial paper, uh, all right, so they stepped into the market let's see what we're looking at. With how they were pricing out that CP and and therefore, they did kind of lead to the market to see. And, and people need to realize how important the commercial paper market is to actual commerce that goes on here in the country and around the globe. All right. So you see where it says sell limit at the top, that very first green line. It's receivables. Yeah. Right click it. On a needed basis, you have institutional players that have And then click the delete. Delete. Yeah. Oh, okay. So right under that white, that's so right off to the bottom. The Fed and the authority. Not that bottom. The bottom of the chart. My bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go down a little bit more. Right there. Right click. 
uh, creating it. And do trading. And moving the spreads. Click on trading, and then click uh, shoot sell stop. Man, stop loss. No, 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 sell stop. Done that's working quite well, actually. Oh, stop. Wait, yeah. what sell stop? I think that's when it goes on the way down. It'll take it on the way down. And sell limits when it take it on the way up. I believe that's how it works. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, what, what's, the, wait, what's the difference between stop loss and uh, sell stop? Stop loss is that pendant, that order that you actually have right now. You see how you remember what I told you? If it go up to X amount of dollars, it'll take the money. Stop loss is when it goes down in a negative a certain amount. It'll, 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 you know, stop to cut your losses. Okay, so sell stop is dollar amount. Stop loss is just a line if it passes this line. Yeah, so stop loss is stop your losses. You know what I mean? Because you're in the current trade right now. You know what I mean? So you want to stop your losses from the current trade. So let's say it goes like negative $30. Remember when I was trading gold and it went and um, it was going in the negative? I did a stop loss because I didn't want to keep going down. To wipe my account out. Remember? Yeah, I see what you're yeah. Huh? I'm gonna give you access to a so that's stop losses for that pending order that you got going on. You see how you, if you look to the left of that red line, you see where it says um, SL, that means stop loss. And then you got 200, and, um, I think you got like 21 pips on that, right? And that's when it says negative $9.87. Negative $9 that means if you lose $9.87, it's gonna stop the cancel the trade. Oh, okay, yeah. different traders use this tool this year. And before I share you the, the link, it's going to be okay. All right, no, this is interesting. Before I do that, cool. I'm going to tell you a little bit. About so that's when you go to the bathroom or something like that. You come back. Come you're comparing one currency versus yeah. Otherwise, the other. just you're just clicking this. Or, yeah. yeah. Of household disposable income that goes to mortgage payments was roughly seven and a half percent in 2008. It's down to four percent now. It's going lower still. This is the Fed's most direct way to interact with Hold on, let me let me make sure i set this one up real quick mortgage market to function is <coughs> really crucial and so far so good all right barry thanks a lot we want to ask everybody to stay with us because we have a little thing called an election uh the backdrop to all this there's an there's an election going on we're going to talk about that right after this break All right, I'm just making sure I ain't missing nothing. All right, I'm back. I'm back. All right, so where you at? Okay, so you, you get the point now, you know what I mean? Yeah. But what you click? You click buy. It could go back up because that's that W forming that I was telling you about. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Remember the W I was telling you about? Yeah. 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 So, you know what I mean? It's, it, see, the thing about stuff like that is like, it could go back up because of the W, right? But at the same time, because of the, the coronavirus, you don't know no more. You know what I'm talking about? So it's, sometimes you can't, it's hard to just do that now because of the coronavirus. But normal, yeah. normally, like if you look, if you scroll all the way back to like before the coronavirus was a thing, you'll see what I'm talking about. But I mean, like, all these scalpers have to be, like, super paying attention, huh? Yeah, but at the same time, even when they're going up, down, that's, you can get that out real quick. Like, if you remember that range I was telling you about when it went up, down, up, down? If you wait till it go up and do a sell, boom, you can get that real quick. You know what I mean? I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm still learning to be that good, but people can do that stuff. I'm not that good yet, at least not yet. That's why I'm practicing with these smaller lot size. Oh, this junk will go down some more. Let me go ahead on place the trade in now.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance at home, folks, each of us in our respective homes trying to bring you some information as we all hunker down during this coronavirus pandemic. And I want to talk about something we haven't touched on yet in this hour, and that is politics. Uh, Joe Biden seems to be now, uh, if he ever was before, more than ever, the front runner uh, in the Demo for the Democratic nomination. We had a few more. I'm doing a small lot side. I want to see how far down to go. Uh, it's like it's going to copy that, though. Oh, I did that to tip that, time, that too. Of the virus. He got some slack Let's for that. Uh, although President Trump came out and thought that uh, Governor DeWine was doing the right thing and the prudent thing. But I, I want to get a rundown of where we stand on the political front, uh, where Joe Biden stands with Jessica Smith, who's not at our Washington bureau, but at her home in Washington. And Jess, what's the latest there? Well, Joe Biden had a huge night. Wait, do you have to double click when you buy and sell? Nah, you, and, and it could be the platform that you're using. Like, did you download the uh, MetaTrader? You probably, uh, I'm not sure. Like, no, I'm not, I just I just click it once. You know what I mean? And then just instantly do it. Yeah. Yep. See, you look like it's trying to form that W I was telling you about. So you might be in there. supported Senator Sa Sanders saying that he hears them so really trying to unite the party and yeah I meant to buy at a Senator Sanders campaign 12721 mm -hmm. that's when you do the the buy, the buy limit thing <laughs> remember, remember what I'm talking about yeah but it just like it yeah I know I remember yeah, I couldn't buy mm -hmm. them money try okay so you're using the I want to bring in here so I'm using the MetaTrader that's on like the Forbes website instead of like the MetaTrader for website that could be it. I'm not sure, but maybe that could be it. Some are questioning why he's still hanging on. I think a lot of Democrats <clears throat> electors are starting to resent him. Uh, he's pushing <clears throat> Biden to the left, which is the last thing Biden wants to do on climate change issues like that. I think that Biden would like to make an adroit pivot to the center. It's hard to do with uh, Bernie still in the race. So I think over the next few days, the pressure will be enormous on Bernie to get out. He can still you know, have a platform. But I think the party has to come together. And what about uh, the the effect of the coronavirus on the overall presidential election? Do you think that this is playing more uh, as a positive for President Trump or as a negative? Because if you look at recent polls, there was a Wall Street Journal uh, NBC poll. There was an Axios poll. Confidence does not seem to be with the president right now. Most people are more confident in things like uh, the CDC. Uh, and, and local and state governments as opposed to federal governments and President Trump. I think you're right. You look at the, the numbers for Dr. Fiocchi, you look at uh, how popular actually Mike Pence has been. I think Pence has done a pretty good job. Uh, Mnuchin's done a pretty good job. But Trump still wants to boast about how great a job he's done. And look, I think he got off to a very rocky start. So I never thought I'd say this, but uh, I think the chances of Trump's reelection have dipped quite a bit. Uh, I think that uh, unless he turns this around quickly, he'll be the underdog to Biden. And I want to talk a little bit about this stimulus package that's hopefully making its way uh, quickly through Congress. Yesterday, we saw uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin come out and say that this is going to be a trillion dollar stimulus package, more than we saw uh, in the 08 um, recession when the I think the package was more like $750 billion. Yeah, it takes a minute to learn, man. Like even I'm still learning a lot, you know what I mean? What might be needed. Yeah. Alexis, I but when you get there, bro, you're good. Before, uh, we get a bill in a couple of days for $100 billion to help victims uh, with in unemployment aid, uh, sick leave aid, things like that. Then next week, we talk about the big one, which will at least be a, a trillion. And then I have a hunch there's going to be another bill in the summer close to a trillion. So these are staggering numbers. The deficit may go as high as $3 trillion in this fiscal year, but nobody really cares about that. I'll give Trump credit. I think he's had a pretty good week compared to some previous weeks. When he said yesterday, we're going to go big, it gave everyone on Capitol Hill cover, including Republicans who are reluctant to spend a huge amount of money. They've got cover from Trump, and I give him credit, and I think that the sky's the limit on how much they're going to spend. Is there anything Trump can do right now to save his presidency? I mean, if he throws everything at this pandemic, which it seems like he's ready to do. And we saw last week him parade out CEOs of major Fortune yeah. 500 companies. Um, you know, to be able to pull all of that together, some are saying not quick enough, but he's pulling it together. 
Is that going to be enough as this plays out over the, the weeks and possibly months ahead? Would it be enough to actually turn confidence in favor of Trump? And perhaps some people would say, you know what, we just don't need the regime change in Washington during yeah. such a tenuous time. Well, I think he needs to move the country. I think he needs to communicate consistently. He needs to stop boasting. He needs to stop picking fights with governors. There, there are things that he can do. If this does start to turn around, sure, he could win re-election. But I think a calming presence is not one of the attributes that he brings to this crisis. All right, everybody, we're going to take a short break and be back with much more, including all of the market action. The index is still deep in the red. We'll be right back. Okay, so it, it kicked me out now. I should stop loss. You know what I mean? Cut yeah, your loss. Yeah, yeah. See? Okay, cool. Makes it easy, much easier to understand, right? Yeah, So isn't like right now a super volatile time to, to be buying and selling and stuff? Yeah, but it goes both ways though. Like you hit a good jack, you can get a good lick, but you lose a good lick too. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. But in order for you to not lose too much, you gotta have a good lot size and a good stop loss. 
I gotta, I gotta get, I gotta start getting in the hang of using um, better lot sizes. And what's a lot size? Like the point zero five at the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, one sec. I need to Adidas, which at first emailed all of its employees and said, we're keeping all our stores in the U.S. open, and here's why. And, and the CEO uh, sent a, kind of an ill-advised email where he said, uh, closing down is easy. Staying open requires courage. And that got quickly criticized. And it took only 24 hours until yesterday afternoon for Adidas to completely reverse that and say, okay, we're closing down all our stores in the U.S. So I think you're going to see the uh, domino effect continue. And then just quickly, you mentioned you know, small businesses and workers. Boy, that's much harder because a chain of Nike size, of course, Nike has to say and is pressured to say and is saying <laughs> we're still paying all of our retail employees while stores are closed. But if you're a small business and you own only one store or you're a restaurant or you own three or four stores, it's bad enough that you're closed right now. That That's a huge hit. But to also pay your employees, I mean, they probably can't do it. So, gosh, the, the ripple effects to, to all corners of the economy, we're going to see this for a long time. I think next the discussion is going to be even when the coast is clear, so to speak, and stores reopen and sports start again, there's going to be a hit to businesses for, for months and months and months to come because of this. All right. I want to bring in Stacy Whitlitz. She is a retail analyst at SW Retail Advisors. And Stacy, thanks for making time for us uh, this morning. To jump off of what Dan was talking about, uh, in the end, I would imagine some of these retailers, they've never seen something of this magnitude. Some of them will simply not be able to survive, including some of the bigger names. Who are you watching right now? Who are you watching closely to see how they weather this storm? Sure. You know, you know, we had over 9,000 store closings last year in 2019, and you know, this is just adding insult to injury here. So, for those who are in turnaround mode or attempting to be in turnaround mode, like a J.C. Penney or Gap, you know, even Old Navy, they went through a period where their margins were down several hundred basis points, and they're just recovering from that. This comes at the worst time as we go into spring, summer, um, and it really just shuts down business. You know, Inditex reported today, which is the parent company of Zara, and they were talking about sales down 24% from March 1st through the 16th. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude just for the first half of the month, and that's when stores were open. So, you know, I think you have to look at global companies. Most companies now have exposure to Europe, whether it's Ralph Lauren at 20%, or PBH that owns Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein, 40% in Europe. Europe's problems are... Um, particularly in the UK, where I am right now, I would argue is just getting started here. So there are the leaps that we have to worry about, like the JC Pennies, the Gap, Asna, Zena, um, you know, the, the ones that we've all heard about on kind of teetering on that fence. But also we have to worry about the strong that have, you know, so much exposure to Italy, to Spain. We're going to hear from Guest tonight, which has about 12% exposure to Italy. So, you know, these numbers are going to be ugly. And the question I'm asking is, while well, everybody's closing stores for two weeks, my estimate is that stores will have to be closed for probably almost 30 days here because the numbers are so worse here. And I want to talk about Apple. Uh, I see it down about 13. Uh, no, I'm sorry. That is not the right. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to bring up Apple. But Apple is down today, not by 13%. But it is uh, under pressure, as is the rest of the market. Here it is. It's off about more than 2 2.5% right now. And and uh, Dan, we had Dan Ives over at Wedbush now call into question the rollout of the 5G iPhone. It's supposed to happen in the fall. He's now saying, fat chance, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a real problem because amid all of this, and again, Apple was the first to, to really start to close stores. You know, it closed its stores in China relatively rapidly. Now, of course, as China, as the number of cases uh, starts to go down there, Apple has reopened some of those stores in China, which is a good sign. Uh, amid all, all this in the last few weeks, Apple bulls have been able to remain bullish. And the biggest thing they've pointed to is mm, the 5G iPhones are coming. Oh, they're coming. And once they come, that's going to be a big boost because you'll finally see people start to upgrade. Remember a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago, in January 2019, when, when Apple gave that warning about Bro. sales in China uh, and the stock dipped so much. I mean, boy, so much changed in the 10 months after that. Apple stock really came roaring back. 
But at that time, when Apple was saying, you know, iPhone sales have slowed a little bit in certain markets, and people were also criticizing, they were saying the problem now is that the upgrade cycle has slowed. There's not as much motivation or reason to buy the newest iPhone every time. The retort amid all that by the bulls was, well, services, look over at services. So even if iPhone sales are having trouble, there's services to be excited about. Now, you know, the, the excitement has really turned back <coughs> to the phones because of 5G. And everyone has said, oh, once they get that 5G iPhone out, boy, sales are going to come back. Everyone who has um, delayed an upgrade is going to rush to upgrade. And at first, uh, we thought that some of the 5G iPhones would come early fall. Then there were reports that, well, there's going to be two types of 5G iPhones because there's two different operating systems. One of those types might be delayed to late fall, maybe even to December. Now we're talking about uh, you know, a likelihood that no Apple 5G-equipped iPhone is going to come out in 2020. And I think that's a problem. Now, of course, everyone is going to face problems. All these major retailers and companies are going to see huge hits. So I still think that you know, there's a case to be made that Apple can weather the storm pr pretty well. But boy, uh, you know, the 5G iPhone is what people were pointing to as the reason Apple can get through this. Now, who knows how long it'll be. And I just have to say, I've been a, a little bit of a 5G skeptic for the last couple of years. I mean, <laughs> it, the hype was kind of vague and everyone was just saying, 5G, it's coming, it's going to be big. But if they can't get the 5G equipped devices out that quickly, it's going to be a delay. <laughs> All right, Dan Roberts, everybody, thanks so much. Please stay where you are because we'll be back right after this break. Morning. What are you doing? Is it obvious? We're delivering live market. question is really dependent upon a lot of variables that we're still trying to figure out. Number one is we're all kind of self-quarantining here at least for the next two weeks. So if the virus here in the U.S. and in most of Europe does kind of pass through and starts to abate substantially in the next two weeks, then we're not going to see the worst of it. And Deutsche Bank's call is going to be a little aggressive, in my opinion. However, 
if we do see it prolonged, you know, into April, maybe into May before the virus starts to abate and people start coming out of their houses and getting back to normal life, then you're going to have a situation where a lot of companies have either been forced to lay off workers unless this gigantic, you know, stimulus package from the government pays all these people through the next uh, three months. And, and companies, especially on the retail level that have, you know, hourly workers or transient workers yep. can't just yeah, simply good. spin up their operations and get back to, to normalcy. So that will be a prolonged uh, downturn. Mm. So like, is it not and they are major part more of worthwhile to like, so if you're looking at entertainment, uh, the uh, British pound versus Japanese, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, would it not be like worth it to uh, like see how the British economy is doing and how the Japanese economy is doing? I don't know if people look at it like that. Maybe if you trade longer trends, maybe, you know what I mean? But for scalpers, we don't want that much. We just need 10 pips. You know what I mean? It's going to be dependent upon how deep these businesses have to cut into. Like, it's all about the trends, you know? That, of course. Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm going to go back, right? You looking at my screen? So I'm going to go back to before everything went down south. You know what I'm talking about? So normally, you, you, and you'll be able to see the trends I'm talking about. Remember the M's and the W's? Yeah. And boom, 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 boom. I wouldn't have gotten right here. Another M. Boom, boom, boom. It's, it's usually just an M to a W. Boom, boom, boom. Boom. The only thing is, you just got to have a, a pretty decent sized stop loss to hold when it goes up and when it goes down too far. You know what I'm talking about? Like right here? Well, that would have been a good one, too. It's kind of on the way down. Just a W. Boom, boom. That's another W for some reason, but I probably got out right here. Normally, like you can see, it's W's and you know, M's and W's or other trend lines, or downtrend or uptrends. So that's the daily chart. So if I go to the monthly chart, matter of fact, the weekly chart, just the weekly chart. Near-term positive impact from the COVID-19 outbreak, adjusted earnings per share, a penny above what the street was estimating. And when we take a look at the different segments of General Mills' business, the pet food business actually did quite well and the gross margin within that segment beat estimates by about 18 basis points. But on the flip side, on the negatives, we did see that organic sales growth, which is a key metric that a lot of investors- See how that look? This probably was like a normal day. By right here. And then such great news you there. can see the the coronavirus hit in right here. The company actually gave so it's kind of hard to look at the trends now because of that. Due to a lot of yeah. consumers getting out there, trying to panic buy a lot of these shelf-stable goods. I do want to mention, though, when we do talk about the consumer packaged good space, um, General Mills isn't as positively impacted as some of its competitors, such as a Campbell's Soup and or the likes of Kroger. So that's one thing to keep in mind. It's been hard for a lot of investors that have been long-term investors in these consumer packaged good companies, but whether or not you choose to jump in now as we are seeing the positive impact for COVID-19, that remains a big question going forward. And, and you're right. I mean, a lot of that pantry stocking is uh, is what's helping a company like like General Mills. And and the president this past week tried to come out and and encourage people to not hoard essentials, saying that our supply chains within this country are very strong, and that people's instinct to sort of go out and clear the shelves is is misguided. Uh, I don't know about all of you, but certainly in my uh, nearby stores, supermarkets, and and pharmacies, there are still lots of very empty store shelves. Uh, so I don't know how many people are heeding what the president uh, had to say. Uh, before we let you go, Heidi, FedEx uh, suspending its financial forecast due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, so FedEx, along with a lot of other different companies within the market, really can't seem to put a number on the financial impact that they will see due to this COVID-19 outbreak. The fact of the matter is FedEx and its rival UPS still have to make sure their businesses are running because people do need to receive their goods and packages. So that is not a company that we're going to see suspend business. But for now, FedEx, along with a slew of other corporations, multinational corporations, I
I want to, uh, I want to bring Nan in here um, and we ask you all to be patient with us and with the technology. Sometimes things drop out, but we are here and we will be back. And Dan, you have more on, on what FedEx had to say about, about the virus. Yeah, I was just going to say, Alexis, that uh, yesterday when FedEx came out with its earnings uh, and it showed a, a drop, you know, the company listed a number of its headwinds. Obviously, coronavirus is first on the list. Obviously, coronavirus is the biggest. It also included uh, a loss of business from one large customer. We all know who that large customer was. It's Amazon, as well as a couple other factors. So I just want to say, you know, there are so many companies that are suffering because of the virus. But FedEx is one of them that, that really was having some real issues with its, its business and, you know, that industry. I mean, both FedEx and UPS before there ever was coronavirus and not only the loss of business from Amazon um, but also Amazon as a competitor and people using uh, alternate methods you know they also talked about um, rising costs for, for ground shipping so FedEx kind of like Boeing is not just a coronavirus story right now yeah good point thanks for making it we're gonna fight back to take a look also at how this pandemic is affecting um, the entertainment industry musicians actors etc cetera, etc cetera. do stay with us Whenever there would be any catastrophe that was on the air, she would say, always look for the helpers. Because if you look for the helpers, you'll know that there's hope. For the world's greatest spy. I am way too good at this. The ultimate mission needs the ultimate disguise. I can see my butt and your face at the same time. <laughs> Being a pigeon can make you an even better spy. Fact, pigeons can see in slow motion. you're doing now man i'm still looking at these things I think I'm gonna move that. Damn, son, this would be a nice little low too. I wonder what's gonna happen. Latest on the casino industry and and uh, I, I guess one? businesses all but shut down so, along the Vegas Strip. What what new news do you, you see? My screen. That's right. Yeah. So normally when it makes a high, it goes to the previous high or previous low. That makes sense, right? Operations in North America. Mm -hmm. This would be the lowest of the low. So how low would this go? Operations in North America, and you can. Tell that these, uh, this follows also MGM. So it if it passed this lo next low and I got in first when this and it goes so low, in, in, in China, they have that'd be crazy. And shutting down the casinos temporarily in Macau, which was a huge deal for them. I mean, I make money though, pressure. so I guess that's... now they continue to be under pressure as now they're having to shut down their operations here in North America. And this is that's crazy. You know what I'm talking about? On the floor is that yeah. this economy is so service oriented. So much with services. I'm gonna wait till it pass this line right here. And I'll help me turn. It just brings everything to wait, which line? All right, I want to uh, get it feel that's a nice segue okay. over in the entertainment industry going from casinos to entertainment and Sabine because is I would have if this didn't form, I would have got in when it passed the bar. The box office has been but because this came all the way down and came back up, I'm gonna wait till it passed that. 
And then I forget it. Because that would be lower. That would be lower. That would be the lowest. Since this thing started, I guess. And Netflix. And now there's the coronavirus. And a lot of movie theaters have to close down. So the latest to do that is Cinemark. They're the third largest movie chain in the country. And they're following on the heels of AMC and Regal. And in terms of what's happening, for example, in different cities like New York City, Mayor Bill de Blasio closed down all theaters in New York City. But now other parts of the country are doing the same. So now nine states have followed suit. And it's expected that other states in the country, maybe possibly all states, will close movie theaters by the end of this week. Yo, I wanted to see the new, um, what's the name of that thing called? Men in Black movie. Again, again, taking a look at and the then as soon as I wanted to go again, see it, this thing came out. Breakers were never, uh, uh, put Wait, what, what this thing came out? This, uh, what's the thing called? Corona. And you can't watch Men in Black? Or you just don't want to go to the... I just don't want to go to the movie theater. So people can cough for my neck, bro. I don't have nobody cough for me. And did you play uh, Apex yesterday? Nah. Nope. You are looking at right now the S&P that's down about 5%. It, it would have to be down 7% for a circuit breaker to take place. And that would be the fourth circuit breaker in eight trading sessions. So we're not there yet. Anything could really go, go as far as today is concerned. We could rally. We could come off it. Uh, but also they need to stop talking about some rally, man. Like, there's, it's impossible for us to rally if we close transportation from outcoming and incoming people to the United States. It's impossible. Well, here's the thing, dude. Do you expect people to rally, like, virtually, like, on the internet where people are the most toxic? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're not pulling anyone. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, like, if you're sitting there saying nobody can come in or leave, how do we, you know what I mean? There's no food in the store. There's no rally. It's just going to go down more. It's just taking this time right now. That's all. This is absolutely correct. So I do some work down in the oil patches down in the Eagle Ford and the Permian Basin. And a lot of the co the lift cost per barrel down in that down in that region is somewhere in the $35 to $45 a barrel uh, range. So obviously at these, at these types of prices, it doesn't make sense to even pull it out of the ground right now. This is a double whammy to the, besides the virus, it's a, it's a double whammy to the global economy as the Saudis, uh, the kingdom is out there just trying to regain their market share. This is this is clearly what they're doing. Um, they're going to keep prices depressed. There are some estimates that their lift costs are somewhere between five and ten dollars a barrel in their in their legacy oil fields. So they have some they have some room to move here. They have lots of cash on their balance sheet. If we look at the kingdom as a as a company, uh, if you will, so. You're right. This is not good. We're not going to be able to prop up the economy by us going out and driving 500 miles a day because gas is now below two dollars a gallon. Uh, we need to get this back online, and I dare say, if it stays down here, the the firms in the oil patch will be a lot like the last time the Saudis did. They'll be going and they'll be drawing down their bank lines, and they may be the next group that will step up to the government and ask for help. Thirty seconds or less, Keith. What are you looking for to see that we have actually hit a bottom? And as had mentioned, perhaps two up days in a row. What are you looking for? So that's one of the factors that we would look for. I'd look for the I'd look for the S and P five hundred to hold at that December twenty eighteen low. If you remember where we had those drawdowns there, uh, that's the second thing. And the other thing that I'm going to look at is not necessarily an up day. I don't think we're going to get it here. Uh, but having uh, the markets trend a little higher into the close, if we can see some imbalances that go in the positive direction, that means that investors are starting to step in and put a bid under this market. All right. For now, though, that is investors are not going to do that because they know that's going to keep going down. It will be dumb. Like I'm, a, I want to. Like yeah, I'm not a million dollar investor, but. I want to invest into a market that I know is going to keep going down. That's just giving away free money. Starcraft game and I totally like didn't do anything for the first like five minutes. 
which means I'm going to get destroyed. Where's my Finance, like a lot of people in New York City, the Yahoo Finance team is all working from home, but we've got you covered through this market sell off with everybody that you count on. I want to bring you some breaking news right now, and this is coming from CNBC. They are reporting that Governor Cuomo here in New York will not approve a shelter in place for New York City. So we're going to discuss what those ramifications are as we go forward, but also want to talk about what's going on with these markets, because at the opening bell, shortly after that this morning, we saw the Dow fall below 20,000. We were around 1900, uh, 19,850. To give you an idea of why this is important, President Trump was inaugurated on January 20th of 2017. The market was at the Dow, at least, was roughly 19,800 at that point. So we have almost wiped out the gains that we have enjoyed, at least on the Dow, for the last three plus years. To talk about all of this, we're going to be joined throughout the next hour by my co-host, Julie Hyman. We've also got Brian Chung, who covers the Fed for us, as well as Akiko Fujita and our tech expert, Daniel Howley. But I want to bring everyone up to speed on where we stand with coronavirus right now. And Anjali Kamlani does that for us at Yahoo Finance. Anjali? Thanks, Adam. Yeah, so we know that the, the case count has really hit a new milestone, 200,000 200, globally and more than 8,000 deaths. That is really ramping up. We know that in the U.S. we're now reaching 6,500 cases, which is a huge jump really within just a week's time from what we were seeing before. And we know that has a lot to do with the testing that is continuing to ramp up. Meanwhile, we're looking at travel restrictions and you know lockdowns. And as you mentioned, we haven't got that stay in place here in New York, but in other areas, we know that there was in, in California. And we're seeing how all of these social distancing measures are helping to to you know, war, uh, reduce the amount of cases that we see possibly. So we're waiting to really see what that full picture looks like with the testing. Meanwhile, President Trump announced earlier that he's going to be closing that border with Canada except for trade. So we're waiting to hear more details on that as well. Meanwhile, we know that the FDA is also taking part in uh, you know, adjusting some of its rules to help with some of these social distancing measures. So when you're talking about clinical trials, which are so important, right now we know when you're talking about a vaccine or treatment that's happening um, if uh, participants are not able to get to the trial site they are looking to adjust those to telehealth um, type uh, video chat conferencing or phone conferencing so that's a really important step that they're taking as well today Anjali Kemlani thank you very much we have got to pay attention to what is happening with Boeing shares of Boeing right now are about to fall below a hundred dollars a share there at 100 uh, and maybe $100.30 a share. The reason we bring this up at this moment is that Boeing has confirmed that it is seeking a $60 billion 
You could call it a bailout. They're calling it loan guarantees. Those of us old enough to remember the 1980s, similar to what the government did for the then Chrysler Corporation, backstopping the loans, not necessarily a handout. To talk about what this means, I want to bring in my co-host, Julie Hyman, as well as the other guests from Yahoo Finance. But Julie, you first. What is the ramification of helping Boeing? Well, the ramification for helping Boeing, according to Boeing, is that it's going to help a lot of jobs. That's the argument that the company is making here, uh, because it is saying that it supports two and a half million uh, jobs overall and 17,000 suppliers in the sort of Boeing ecosystem, right? Not just the company directly, but all of the suppliers and the people who work for it. So that's what it's saying. As you know, Adam, I mean, this is a politically thorny issue, just like it was during the financial crisis when the banks got help from the government, right? They argued at that time that there was systemic risk going with this argument about its sort of ecosystem. It appears to be making the same sort of argument. At the same time, again, as you know, politically, a lot of people are pushing for more aid for most citizens of the United States. That's something the Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin talked about yesterday. So there's that sort of tension. And I guess we'll see in the end if you get either or both of these aid packages happening for individuals and also for big corporations. Let me bring in Akiko Fujita because, Akiko, you and I both follow the airlines here in the United States as well as globally. And yesterday we got a dire prediction about what all of the airlines worldwide face. Bring us up to speed. Yeah, it was a pro pretty sobering number that we got from IATA, which is, of course, the global trade group for these airlines, uh, talking about $113 billion revenue loss. Now, that was the forecast they put forward a few weeks ago. For now, they're sticking to it. But one of the things I thought was quite interesting and quite troubling is that when you look at the airline industry globally, they're talking about 75% of airlines globally running out of cash in the next three months. And when the chief economist that Ayata was asked yesterday on the call about you know, um, how much would be needed, he said uh, they're looking for a government support in the amount of $150 billion. And then he also said, look, I don't know how many airlines are gonna be around for that. So that's a key thing to watch. I wanna pick up on Julie's point here though, because you know, Julie mentioned the, the political ramifications. I don't think you can overstate that enough. Uh, you look at a company like Boeing, you already hear uh, some of the unions coming out and saying any bailout packets need to include protections for workers. That 2008 is still fresh in a lot of people's minds. They don't want these packages just for CEOs. And we heard Mark Cuban this morning on CNBC saying, look, no share buybacks. You know, any bailout, we need commitments from these companies. And so I think that's something to watch a little further down the line. Okay. You hear that, Kemchi? What is that? They say no more buybacks, so we can't we can't die again. <laughs> can't feed me, bro. No more buyback. You may not use these benefits you get from the taxpayer to buy back shares. I think that should certainly be part of the contingency here. If you're doing a bail bailout um, for not only Boeing but the broader airline industry, is look, we've had record stock share buybacks for the last couple of years hitting all-time highs last year the year before and look we're facing as a lot of folks are talking about a corporate credit crisis in the credit markets and a lot of that has to do with the share buybacks and going back to julie's point also piggybacking on akiko's point you're going to have this ingrained in the fabric of the country when it comes to bailouts you're going to see ire this is something i'm hearing in multiple conversations that i'm having about this and a lot of these conversations frankly adam they're just really blending together and this is something to watch how are you going to take care of the workers how are we going to take care of small medium-sized businesses who are also suffering at this so uh, I don't think this is a story that's going to go away anytime soon. And yes, you got to pay attention to the tensions there. And there absolutely should be some sort of contingency plan. You cannot do share buybacks. I agree with that point, Adam. All right. Julia LaRoche, stay right there. Paul Schatz, I want you to come into this discussion, especially because, as Julia pointed out, we've got the Treasury Department moving very quickly. Okay. Steve so far. last night, uh, frightened a great many people. He told Republicans in the Senate, they need to pass some kind of stimulus package or we could face 20% unemployment. And th that's a good point for me to remind everybody that the Senate is expected to vote later today on the first of the stimulus packages from the House regarding coronavirus. But there's also this issue of putting money in the pockets of Americans. Mnuchin said yesterday, within two weeks, 
they want to put money in the I'm looking at the S&P, boy. I don't know I want to go down, boy. 20% potential unemployment or that need to put money in everybody's pocket? First, on the need to put money in everyone's pockets, whatever plan they're floating, whether it be for Boeing, the airlines, the cruises, companies, individual checks and pockets, it's not enough. Anytime they come out, my first tweet is, it's not enough. I've already emailed my congressman this woman this morning, it's not enough. True shock and awe is doing the unfathomable. Anything else is piecemeal and is not going to work, and, is, and the markets certainly aren't going to like that. So when it comes to lumping this all together, I'm telling you, just using a cocktail napkin and a pen, you're talking about trillions, plural, when all said and done. And I wonder, in this election season, is there a political will to step up with a nuclear bomb right now instead of firing smaller weapons? But I think they, if they really want to get to the heart of this, shock and awe right away into the trillions and then apportion it out. Uh, let's bring Brian Chung into this, because Brian understands the monetary side of stimulus as well as fiscal stimulus. And Brian, I believe you have a question. <clears throat> <clears throat> yeah, and Paul, I was just kind of curious. So right now, it seems like there's a lot of confusion right now about what monetary policy should be doing. We saw the Fed unleash a number of tools on Sunday. They also announced the commercial paper facility yesterday, primary credit dealer facility yesterday. Does this put more of an onus on fiscal stimulus to do even more because the Fed is continuing to use more of its toolkit? Or do you think that monetary policy still has plenty of room in a way that actually policymakers on Capitol Hill even might say, hey, we still have a little bit more time to hobble through some sort of package here. Last point first, we don't have time. We're, we're out of time. And I really want, wonder whether the people in Congress have any clue what's going on out there. That's one. Two, the huge seminal difference between 08 and today. In 08, remember, the Fed pulled liquidity in the summer of 08, which exacerbated the Lehman crisis. That was the biggest mistake they made in the modern era. Today, they literally took every fire hose they have and opened up the spigots to an unlimited degree. So the Fed is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. There'll be more programs every week, every month, until we get at least through half to three quarters of the crisis. It's now the fiscal opportunity, but the Fed is doing everything they can. I love how they open swap lines with the ECB and the BOJ. This week, I mean, look, Powell gets it finally. The, he, the light went off. There's the aha moment. But folks like Rand Paul and, and, and people in Congress, Mnuchin clearly gets it. He's, who would ever thought Steve Mnuchin would be the star of the Trump administration when he got appointed? But he's, he's one of the adults in the room. There is nothing that shouldn't be considered. And anything they consider that people say is preposterous is what should be considered because this is – clearly unprecedented there's no model to go from let's be overly cautious like we're okay. all doing working from working you know isolated versus hoping and praying it will get better okay paul hold there because julie has a question for you and that's going to be followed by a question from akiko hey paul um it's good to talk to you so uh, as you've been talking right now and talking about all that we need to throw at this problem i'm struck by the your note that i read this morning which actually sounded more optimistic to me um, and you, it sort of had a more of a resilient tone. And so I'm curious, as you are assessing government response and also assessing market response, as we see the S&P 500's drop right now approaching 6% on an intraday basis, how are you thinking about this on a personal level and that resilience and also on a market level and your investing strategy? So when you get into the few times like this, this is 87 or 08, and for people who are left from the Depression, unless you truly think capitalism as we know it is in jeopardy, we have always gotten through crises, and we will. This has to work its way through. So for someone to say, I mean, I've had people say, seriously, is all my money going to zero? Will we ever recover? Of course you will. We are the same thing, you know, after 9-11 when – Habits were supposedly changed forever. Travel habits. They were changed in the short term. People were you know, hunkering down, but we got through that. 
the financial crisis, which this is clearly not the same. It's always a different kind of crisis. When so after the financial crisis, the response was to prevent another financial crisis. So the banks aren't quote unquote in jeopardy. Now we've got other industries, but how can you not, once we get through this dark period, and this is, it's pretty dark, we will get through this. It's crazy to believe that markets won't recover and that the economy won't recover. The only question is, is the economy going to be, be a V, a U, or more like a hockey stick, which I don't think it's a hockey stick, but it'd be arrogant and ignorant for me to say I could tell you today if it's a V or a U. A lot depends on policy response. And, and frankly, the people who are not taking this, I can't believe the images on Twitter of people frolicking on the beach or lining up at bars or some of the folks they've interviewed across the country who say, <laughs> I'm going to get it, you're going to get it, who cares? Paul, you know, it seems like the economic forecasts are starting to catch up to the public health uh, outlook that we're starting to see, and it, it, it looks pretty grim. You know, we got that number from Deutsche Bank today saying they're expecting about a 13% drawdown. One of the things that I've seen in a lot of these notes, a lot of economists saying, well, let's look at what's happening in, in China, because when this was a China-only story as it relates to the coronavirus, there was a lot of talk of, well, you know, when you, back in 2003 with SARS, it wasn't that bad, but now we're starting to see the numbers, and I'm looking at them here, consumer spending down more than 20%, industrial production down 13 percent these are much worse numbers as, as it relates to china so if that is the model or that's the only example we can go off of in terms of the impact from the coronavirus what does that say about what it's likely to be here and i while i understand china's the only model that's right now all the forecasts we're really just throwing darts in a in a in a, in a black room frankly you know i've heard down 5%, down 20%. It's, there's going to be some number that is going to be eye-popping, that the, the economy literally stopped and fell off the cliff. Um, I don't, I, China's a little, their response was quicker. Their lockdown was quicker. Their numbers fell off a cliff quicker. Ours may not be like that. There'll be some, you know, facsimile of that. But clearly the economic numbers, at least through you know, what, what comes out in July, are going to be eye-poppingly grim. But in the end, don't forget one thing in the end, unless you truly believe that people are going to hunker down the rest of their lives and forever change their habits, just like with the Great Recession, there is going to be pretty strong pent-up demand, whether that's unleashed in Q3 or Q4 or even 2021. But eventually, we will return to some semblance of normalcy and people will spend. The economy is going to be different, for sure. Paul Schatz, the uh, Heritage Capital President, I appreciate your joining us during what are trying times for the entire nation. Good to see you, Paul. And as we go to break, I want to draw everyone's attention to what is happening with the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ right now. The Dow is below 20,000. Essentially, we have wiped out all of the Dow's gains since President Trump was inaugurated on January 20th, 2017. S&P 500 is also down 6%. NASDAQ is down a little, almost 5%. Remember, the circuit breakers will kick in at 7%. And finally, Boeing, which we were talking about, the potential for a loan backstop from the government. Boeing's trading at $101 a share right now. When we come back, Brian Chung is going to explain to all of us exactly what the federal government wow. has done to keep the pipeline of liquidity. I'm looking at the Dow, and he said... Since Trump was inaugurated, the Dow started going down. And I guess he was inaugurated in 2017, so it only starts till 2018. You know, you don't just go in, you go in the next year. And I'm looking at the chart. Can you see my screen? screen? Uh, yeah. So it goes, this one goes, it's like, you know, this was like when Obama was in the chair or whatever. And then, you know, it goes up. And then when he got elected, right? Mm -hmm. It goes boom. Not not a small drop. Like these are small drops. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And then here it goes boom. And then it comes up and then it drops hard again. And then it goes up, drops hard again. And then it goes up, drops real hard. And this is 2018. And nothing happened. It just dropped. You know what I'm talking about? Mm hmm. It goes up. What's the Dow? What do you mean? What's the Dow? 
what's that? Oh, so you know how they always talk about the market crash? That's just the first thing they show. So the Dow 30, right, is like the top 30 companies. You know what I'm talking about? Uh-huh. And you got the, and then you got, it's like the top 30 corporations or whatever, or the big time companies. Uh-huh. Dow Jones Industrial Index. And then you have the NASDAQ, which is the top 100 companies. You know what I'm talking about? Then you got the S&P 500, which is the top 500 companies. Okay, I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this, that the uh, Dow Jones represents multiple companies. Uh, see? <clears throat> so this would be like the top 30 companies, you know what I'm talking about? Uh-huh. So, of course, Apple being one of them. Well, Apple falls on the NASDAQ, I think. It does say NASDAQ, actually. Hold on. I guess that's part of it. Apple, Boeing, Caterpillar, you know, the little truck people, Chevron, Coca-Cola, ExxonMobil, IBM, Intel, Johnson Johnson, J.P. Morgan, McDonald's. Those are like the big-time companies. You know what I'm talking about? Nike. Nike's one of them? I didn't know that. That's what they say. Stimulus package that could be being negotiated with the administration and Congress. Also, Secretary Mnuchin from the Treasury denies that he said last night to Republicans that unemployment could reach 20%. Now, one of the things we're watching, the Dow now below 20,000 at 19,878. The S&P 500 is down as well, a little uh, over 5.5%. NASDAQ is down 4.5%. Is Walmart. I'm going to get in this one. Oh, did it? Oh, covers it, Walmart what, for us oh. at Yahoo Finance. And you have some very interesting... Wait, what's this? Oh, this is the monthly chart. Walmart okay. thinks is going to happen once we're past this crisis. Right, Julia? Yeah. Hey there, Adam. Well, actually, it's Credit Suisse giving uh, Walmart an upgrade, uh, going from neutral to outperform for the stock, also raising their price target to $127 per share, up from the $115. And I'm looking at Walmart's stock price right now, and it is rallying. It's up more than 6%, and it's already surpassed that new Credit Suisse price target of $127 per share. And this comes amid the coronavirus COVID-19 concerns. As you know, Walmart it is located about 90 percent of americans are located within 10 miles of a walmart store there are 4700 stores and what credit suisse is basically saying here it's not just a short-term pantry stock up that we're seeing folks stock up on supplies whether it's food sanitation supplies those sorts of things paper products and whatnot this is about a structural change when it comes to shopping and when you look at walmart they've really beefed up their technology capabilities especially when it comes to this buzzword omni-channel, letting consumers shop how they want, when they want, where they want, whether it's online, in-store, buy, in, buy online, pick up in-store, their nascent but fast-growing uh, online grocery pickup and delivery business, which they've rolled out uh, across the fleet at the end of 2019. They had grocery pickup at 3,200 of those 4,700 locations and the delivery capability at 1,600 locations. So again, this goes to showing how Walmart is you know, keeping up with consumers, and they think this will be sticky. Getting consumers in the doors now, um, given these times, and having them pick up new shopping habits, those are shopping habits that are likely to stick around for the time being. So, yeah, we're already at that price target. More to watch here. Adam, And, and Walmart, I should point out, is trading at $127.02 a share, and its uh, 52-week range high was one twenty seven ninety five cents. Dan Halley, you have a question or some insight on this for us. Yeah, I want to ask Julia what's going on with the restocking because you know I'm trying to go on. Just going through my Facebook and I just happened to see a cleaning goods, uh, uh, Asian guy items, and I'm cutting the bat open, eating it. Unavailable. Even Amazon, it's still weak. Oh, so a bat. And the thing about it is, like, when you see that, it's like, damn, y'all ain't learned yet. You know, yeah, and, and Dan Holly, this is a. <laughs> yeah, dude, <laughs> honestly. You know what I mean? Like, I understand that's part of their culture. Yeah, I mean, I'm. Which is okay. But, and like, for example, I mean, like, like, think about it. So, let's say eating chicken was nasty to them, right? Which will make sense because, you know, it's not something that they would do, you know what I mean, right? But if I ate one chicken and wiped out the whole population, 
then and we can't eat chicken no more. And that's just that. No matter how good it is. And you can, you that's just that. You know what I mean? Speaking at the White yeah, House, yeah, um, yeah, recently, CEO Doug McMillan talking about those efforts. That's just that, you know? Because I, I got, you can't stop somebody from eating certain things because that's just part of their culture, you know? Like I was telling my daddy about that too. Because it's like drinking milk. You know how nasty it, like, think about it now. You only drink milk because you were, you, you was raised to drink milk, right? But if you wasn't raised to drink milk, how nasty does it sound to drink milk from a cow? It'd make more sense to drink milk from a human because, you know, you get breastfed, so you get used to it. You know what I'm saying? If that makes sense. You know what I'm talking about? But, you know, just imagine you're not drinking milk from a cow, right? And you come over to the United States and I say, hey, drink milk from the cow because that's what we do. You're going to look at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? But if you drink milk from the cow and it wiped out the whole population, then we ain't touching no more cows around here. That's just that. <laughs> That's just that. Like, if I drink one cow and all of a sudden the whole population getting wiped out, then I ain't touching no more chocolate cows because I like chocolate cows. <laughs> chocolate cows. Yeah. I was raised on chocolate cows around here. Shit. I'm in an eight uh eight person free for all. You talking about that um yeah. soccer? Yeah. Yeah, and like two people just like created a pact, and now they're like trying to kill me because I'm super far ahead. Is it like Age of Empires? Uh, I never played that, so I don't really know. Is that the thing when you gotta go? Age of Empires has an economy, meaning like you gotta go fishing and all that. Yeah, so like you have an economy, and you can either like spend your early resources like on a on an army, mm -hmm. or in making your economy better. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it relies on like, okay, have you like scouted out your enemy? Like, is he going for an economy? Because if he's going for an economy, you either also expand more bases so you can have a stronger economy, mm -hmm. or you make an army because you know he's not going to have an <clears throat> army because he's spending his resources on um, economy. Cause I used to play uh, Warcraft. Let's see. Oh, it's free to play now. What is Starcraft? It is. It looks yeah, like it is. Hold on. Time, Dude, get it. Let's play. Right now we need to keep an eye on Star, that's StarCraft. Which one are you playing? Two or? Yeah, two. Yeah, I think it's free to Yahoo play now. Brian, I thought 12 years ago the alphabet soup of different lending facilities was quite something. Here we go again. That's right, Adam. Well, we had a CF or CPFF facility yesterday, and then we also had a, uh, dis, uh, a new credit dealer facility. Yeah, it's free to play now. So after the market yeah, closed yesterday, the Hold on, let me make sure I see that. Uh, what they call the PDCF, yeah, the primary let me dealer look, bro. I'm going to look at it. Got the letters mixed up in my head at the top of this hit. Basically, what this is, is it's a facility that the New York Fed will be offering to actually take on collateral and then offer loans in exchange. So this is a way that companies and banks, broker dealers will be able to offer up any sort of equities that they can unload or commercial paper, uh, even corporate debt that they cannot liquidate in the market and get a loan from the Federal Reserve in cash that they can then... I look like war yeah, it's like Warcraft. It's different people. Point during the crisis, although it is important to note that when they first opened this type of facility in 2008, they didn't uh, originally take on equity. So this is kind of a new territory for the Federal Reserve to be able to take on equity positions, although they did clarify they will not take on ETFs or mutual funds. Now, the other thing that they announced yesterday, yesterday in the afternoon was that commercial paper funding facility. That is actually interesting because that will be uh, a way for companies back, that are not banks to actually offer up uh, collateral and take loans for the Federal Reserve directly as well. 
uh, Brian, stay there. I want to come back to this, but Julie Hyman is watching breaking news about the scope of the bailout package that's being presented to Congress by the Treasury Department. <clears throat> Julie, what have you got for us? Well, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin is speaking in an interview with CNBC. There's always been the call for monetary policy and fiscal policy. Man, I, that U.S. dollar just wants to drop so bad. I, I can see it. Uh, Mnuchin is proposing $500 billion in aid checks that would be What's theoretically... That? I'm looking at it. Keep going down to that low. He's bouncing back up. And all of this aid uh, package proposal here. He's also talking about $200 billion in corporate aid, $300 billion for small business. It sounds like that that could potentially be in addition to the individual checks. He's saying if um, there's approval of this, oh, the checks would come on April 6th and May 18th here. So in, again, in two installments, that is what Mnuchin's talking about. Uh, Adam, as we were talking about this morning before the show, it's unclear what the process is to get all of this done, if it's just something that Treasury does with approval from the administration. But key, according to Treasury and according to many economists we uh, speak to, or the speed of, that all of this needs to get done. You know, Julie, as you bring us the details of this, the Dow is still below 20,000. Akiko Fujita, what are your thoughts on this? And do you have a question for either Julie or for Brian on the issues at hand, whether it's the bailout package from the fiscal side or the monetary stimulus? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the eight checks, I think, are, are what we were expecting. It is okay, now three people just made a fact to group of us. To this broader package that's going to be coming. So this is kind of the first step. I guess, you know, the question to raise here is that with these aid packages, if we're talking about putting checks directly in the hands of American consumers. Are you downloading it? As not yet, not yet. Yesterday, you know, what kind of stimulus does that provide when we are all holed up at home right now doing our jobs from here? And I have to wonder, you know, those who can't pay the rent, those who can't pay the mortgage, sure, that is some money that goes in that direction. But but I do wonder, I don't know if Brian and Julie have a, a thought here, but, you know, how big of a stimulus can this really provide when yeah. this is the kind of situation that is really unprecedented? Yeah, to, to me, Akiko, at this stage at least, it's less of an economic stimulus and more of a public health issue because how can you have a broad public quarantine, right, if people can't afford to stay home, right? People, especially hourly workers whose businesses are still – up and running, they are going to feel compelled to go to work because of the financial stress. So to me, that is more the issue here, that if you were, for example, to institute a quarantine, you would need to enable people to do so. The stimulus part, I think, would have to come more down the road, to your point about this being multiple innings. So really, the economic underpinnings would have to be pushed out. All right, so as we get ready to go to break, just a reminder, we are awaiting the latest from the Coronavirus Task Force. They're supposed to have a press briefing now. We're watching our eyes on Washington, D.C. for that. The Dow is now still off more than 6%. We're going to keep an eye on that. And when we come back, Yahoo Finance has you covered through this crisis.
is off a little more than 5%. The press briefing from the Coronavirus Task Force in Washington will take place now, we've been told, at 1145. We've got breaking news about potential government stimulus to get the country through. The My name is Paul Mantilli, and as a citizen of the United States of America, <coughs> I proudly fly the stars and stripes in my front yard, stand for the national anthem, and pledge allegiance to the flag. And I am grateful, so grateful, for the visionaries who have truly made this nation a beacon of democracy so that my family and I can pursue the American dream. Today, I'm returning the favor by issuing an urgent message for my fellow Americans. A bold message you won't hear from the mainstream media or from the talking heads in Washington. Yet, it's a message so woven into the fabric of our nation that it would be treason not to share it. In the following video, I reveal everything. You'll see evidence for an economic upgrade that's so big and so powerful, I'm calling it America 2.0. Those at the forefront hopefully, including you, will reap massive financial rewards. However, those who are unprepared will be left behind. Even worse, they could see absolute financial devastation. So please, take some time now to watch. As you'll see, this upgrade is not only imminent, it's already underway. Hi, I'm John Daly, and joining me today is the greatest investor of our time, Paul Mampilli. Paul, thanks for being here. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's great to have you. Now, you've stated that America, this country that we love so much, is about to undergo a massive economic upgrade. That's right, John. And this upgrade is going to be big. So big that citizens from every edge of our great nation, from farmers to doctors, and from 10-year-olds to 100-year-olds, will reap the benefits. And I believe that's just the start. Wow. Now, you've even stated, and I quote, this upgrade will fulfill our forefathers' vision of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all. That's exactly right, which is why I'm calling it America 2.0. America 2.0. Okay. The economy as you can, what is the best approach? Well, the first priority is, is people, Americans, uh, lower middle income households. They're the first priority because they don't have a cash cushion and they're panicked, uh, you know, both because of the health crisis, but also because of the financial situation they're in. Second is smaller businesses. They also have a cash problem. Many small businesses, most don't have much of a cash cushion, don't have access to credit, and uh, they'll be struggling and obviously laying off workers pretty fast here if they don't get some help. And then third, larger companies, uh, the big airline companies uh, would be included. Uh, I think they're uh, third in line, uh, but they also will need help. I, I don't think I'd go the way of providing specific help to specific industries or companies. At this point, I think uh, it, companies and industries broadly will need help getting financing. So I would work on setting up a, a, a credit facility that the Treasury puts equity in, maybe the Fed put some resources in, and they use that to backstop the banking system so the banking system can provide credit to uh, stretched businesses, no matter what industry they're in, no matter who they are. Uh, uh, and, and the banks obviously are in the business of making loans, and they do it well, and they know how to do it. Yo. Let's leverage that up, as opposed to Yo. Hey, you know how to play a spin? Company or this specific industry for, uh, uh, no, why? Bruh, I miss playing Magnus Mid. You ever see me play Magnus Mid? Yeah, dude. Bro, you got to admit, man. I'm a two-time Magnus Mid. Dude, man. That was a fun game, I remember. Bruh. Are you going to play right now? I want to, but I'm going to see how this is playing out right here. I want to, though. I kind of want to go Mid with either Pudge or Magnus. I'm just really like, hold still. With his ulti? Over how long 
you think the businesses can hobble along with the facilities that the Federal Reserve is offering and the fiscal stimulus that's being proposed? And if so, how long is that period? Well, the smaller the, What's up, the, 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 the less time they have. I mean, you know, I live in suburban Philly, my county. They getting your money. They getting your money, Akbat. Closed. Uh, I know that they need cash literally now. I mean, they they don't have a cash cushion. It's my money, and I need it now. Give me a loan. Uh, that's a process, and it's just not practical. And even if they were credit worthy, it could take weeks or months to get that loan. So uh, those are the companies that need the help most quickly. So they're, they're, we need to think of other mechanisms of getting cash into the hands of those smaller businesses. So, for example, and this is something I think is being considered uh, in uh, discussions on Capitol Hill, is a payroll tax rebate. So I'm a company. All companies pay pro payroll taxes for their employees. Uh, th th instead of paying in, uh, they get a check uh, from the system, the payroll system, tax system, that's equal to, let's say, all of the payroll tax they paid on their employees year to date. And then if you're in a, an area that's in lockdown, like my county in suburban Philly, uh, you get double that or triple that. So that's a, that's a quick way. Everybody's going to be in lockdown, small man. Small businesses. <laughs> and again, you're right. I mean, those small businesses. A thousand dollars. Just to give you a number. It's not uh, enough. Well, for one, like I said, it's people should have had money anyway. But a thousand dollars. I think this it should do that a little bit better. You know what I mean? No, I think it was the right way to go about it because you don't know how long you're, you're going to have to do that for. I mean, and a thousand dollars is like semi-sustainable, but anything more would be a little risky. No, a thousand dollars is okay for me. But what about people who live in California or New York where rent is like three thousand dollars a month? Yeah, well, I mean, like, with, I think it's everyone over eighteen will get it. Yeah, uh, Mark, I want to just pick up on your point yeah. uh, about the employment. I think so it's like you have like college student you know, kids, like, yeah, it's like about 10% of companies hiring last week, which is even that number is pretty incredible when you mm -hmm. consider so many cities have been in a lockdown now. Uh, I've already spoken to some small, medium sized businesses myself. I mean, like, because in California, not, you know, I mean, I, like, you know, in California, on Seattle, New York, man, it's expensive out there. Can you speak to the severity? Oh, yeah, for sure. And it's not like it's San Francisco, dude. San Francisco's fucked. And it's not like, it's, like it's not like where it's um. What's up, Agba? It's not like rent expensive because people want someplace fancy. It's expensive just by default. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> by default, and nothing you can do about it. But they weren't laying off. But this, with this week, uh, and towards the end of last week, this week. Mm -hmm. Layoffs have begun to increase quite significantly. Right now, I'm eating a hot pocket. And depending on how fast, I'm seeing how this market going to play out. Get aid into the hands of small I might hop on some Dota. I'm feeling like going mid right now. What the job losses are going to look like, but you know, under almost any scenario, the job losses are going to be well into the hundreds of thousands, probably a million or two, assuming that the Congress and the administration can get it together. Oh, this is the guy that was fighting. Uh, relatively quickly. Um, I, I will say one technical point. We're going to get a jobs number in a couple of weeks. That won't reflect what's going on because that is based on a survey that was done. See, you know, it's lucky that you guys got job where you can work from home. But some people who got like waiters and all of that, who got to show up. GG, boy. For them, it's GG. You know what I'm talking about? It's GG for them cats, bro. I want to remind everybody that as we get close to circuit breaker, ter circuit breaker territory with the Dow and the S&P well, 500, that would trigger it. We're over 6% to the downside on the S&P 500. We are awaiting the coronavirus task force briefing out of Washington, D.C. And a reminder that one of the Navy's floating hospitals, one of those ships, is on its way as soon as it's ready to New York City. The governor and the mayor have been pleading with the president. Come on, man. Cross that line already. And for hospital beds. We are watching the market sell off here at Yahoo Finance, and we're going to help you get through this when we come back. <laughs> What are you doing? Is it obvious? We're delivering live market coverage and offering expert analysis completely free. We're helping you make sense of the markets from anywhere you are. Uh, I get that, but uh, what How are you come you're doing here? British uh, pound to Japanese euro? Well, say pajamas. well pajamas, pajamas. Um, Good. I'm doing both of them because when I, when I look at it, I see it's out of. Really, I just click anyone. Really, there's no reason why. You know what I mean? But the only thing is the pound, the, the uh, dollar and the pound, those are in session. 
Australian dollars, I think, is out of session. I'll tell you right now. What does session mean? Like, the New York Stock Exchange opens from 8 to 5. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So, this is 8 right here. Or, or, or 4 o'clock. As an active intraday trader, that's 4 o'clock because you know of the uh, time change. Not enough. But remember now, London is open and New York is open. So how confident yes, you can trade these, but it just moves slower because they're sleeping. One of the most consistent, you know what I mean? Successful proprietary yeah, trading yeah. desks on Wall Street. Yeah. Located in the heart so, of New York. You can trade Tokyo and Sydney, but it's slower because it's not open. But, you know, it still might, you might catch a couple. Of, well, like scalping ain't that bad. You can still catch some of the scalping. But not only that, it's, it's just a currency that I'm used to for right now. You know what I mean? <clears throat> like, I can click on Gris, uh, pound in Australian dollars and catch a trade here, too. No specific reason. I could set that up too. Oh shoot. Let me make sure I don't miss this trade. What's this look like? Pound dollar. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. The Dow and S&P 500 are both down over 6%. We're keeping an eye on the sell-off. Joining us right now is the co-head of Global Bonds at Janice Henderson Investors. Uh, Nick Maroutsis is here to talk to us about what's happening with bonds. And I've got to ask you, buddy, uh, we're watching the yield on the 10-year actually higher right now, and yet gold is falling. It's been a, one of those weird situations for a couple of weeks where the old norms when people sold off in equities, you would expect to see certain things happen with gold and with bonds. All right, I got in. Let's see how far down it go. Sure, it's, it's a complete dislocation. I think if you look at the credit markets in general, you're seeing very little liquidity, but you're right. Traditional thinking has us that when you get an equity sell off, you get a flight to quality. The problem that we're seeing right now is <clears> that a lot of people are expecting a massive fiscal stimulus plan to come down the chute. We're already seeing it in other countries, and that's likely putting pressure on interest rates. But the traditional hedges are not really working. So investors are now trying to find anything and everything that can hedge their portfolios in a downswing, and the interest rate component is not working. Julian, do you have a question for Nick? I do, Nick, and it goes on the heels of what Adam was saying. What I found confounding is not just that Treasury yields. What were the colors that he told me to change? It was the uh, candle. What was the other? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm in. Stimulus. Where oh, he's we hear leaks of Treasury so, uh, Secretary Mnuchin's plan to give checks to right people. Right and we tend to. We seem to be seeing bonds react. Stop loss right we're there. Not stops react. <coughs> we saw no kind of bounce off the lows there. All right. And I know you're a bond guy. You're not necessarily a cross asset guy, but I'm just curious. You see how I got in this trade right here? Oh man, this is so big. Look, I think that. The, the bigger picture is more so the credit markets, and there's obviously disco dislocation. All right, you see this? Yesterday we saw a pretty sizable amount of new. Yeah, there's two colors you told me to change. It was bear candle and the other. One. Yeah, the bear candle was red. Rates uh, moving. And the other one was um. Trying to hedge those bonds. Matter of fact, let me move this in profit so I can cut my losses. Market, so I'm difficult. trying to lose nothing today. Numerous different facets as to what's happening in the market, but people need to realize that the amount of liquidity in treasuries and in investment grade corporates is dwindling very fast and if you either move down the capital structure to high yield bonds asset backed bonds it's virtually at a standstill so we're, we, we we have a problem in the sense that the, we're not necessarily being able to function normally in go. the credit markets or in the bond market to react as quickly as what's happening in the equity markets um, as I bring Brian Chung into this, just want you to know that New York Governor uh, Cuomo has just re reported that there are 2,382 cases of coronavirus in New York. That is up 1,008 from yesterday. Again, Governor Cuomo reporting 2,382 cases here in the Empire State. Brian? 
And Nick, you were just talking about the different types of funding, and I'm kind of curious. I was just looking at a, a line that crossed uh, the news wires not too long ago that spread on overnight P2 commercial paper was winding to uh, 242 basis points. I think that's the highest since 2008. <coughs> I'm just wondering, with regards to what the Fed's been doing, they've been trying to offer these repo operations. They opened up a commercial paper funding facility yesterday. Are those things going to calm the markets and calm liquidity? Because as, as I understand, the coronavirus didn't start off as a uh, you know, financial crisis, if you will. It just seems like the market tightening happened after that. Where do you see the Fed in terms of the reaction function and being able to quell those liquidity concerns? Sure. So I think it's important to point out that this is certainly not the global financial crisis. As you point out, that was a banking crisis. But I think what the Fed is trying to do is they're trying to dust off the old alphabet soup, alphabet soup in the sense that they're in reintroducing a lot of programs that they had during during the crisis. One of those is the commercial paper funding facility, the CPFF, which was an indirect way uh, to purchase commercial paper. The problem is, is that given the changes in Dodd-Frank, it ruled out the Fed being able to lend directly to single entities again. So the details, while skinny, history can't repeat itself legally in the sense that they're not able to lend the facilities that need this money. So you need almost a better mousetrap. I think what you what you will see over time is that the Treasury could look to indemnify the Fed on anything they buy so that the Fed or the central bank can really put all their weight behind this and throw a ton of money at the problem. And, and ultimately, that will lead to... Wait, is to bull candle supposed to be green control. and bear candle supposed to be red? Uh, basically uh, bull is green, sun, bear is red. Everything under the sun. And legally, okay. like I said, they can't necessarily buy corporates, but I'm guessing that there's some in inner workings in Washington. They're trying to figure out ways to do that. So you combine all these monetary policy uh, combinations with a large fiscal policy package. You know, people are talking about anywhere between five to ten percent of, of GDP, which is a massive number. I mean, we're talking trillions of dollars. Hopefully that can that can at least buy us some time to get us to a point where we can get through the woods on the on the virus shock. All right, uh, Nick Marutsis, we want to thank you for being here, co-head of Global Bonds at Janice Henderson Investors. It's good to get your insight. As we head to break, I want you to know that we pulled big, uh, back a bit from the session lows. The S&P 500 is now off about 5.3%. Dow is off now 5.9%. NASDAQ is off 4.3%. We are waiting the coronavirus task force press conference from Washington, D.C. Yahoo Finance is covering this with you, and we will be back right after this. This thing will stop acting dumb. Come on, man. He's getting no money already. See, right? Remember I told you I'm just working on consistency on winning trades. And then, we, and then after that, then I'll start adding more money in there and making bigger trade. <clears throat> My name is Paul Mantilli, and as a citizen of the United States, there we States go. Let's America, go. Let's go. I proudly fly the stars and stripes. Let's go, man. Yard, stand for the national anthem. Come on. And pledge allegiance to the flag. And I am grateful, so grateful, <laughs> for the visionaries who truly made this nation a beacon of democracy so that my family and I can pursue the American dream. Today, I'm returning the favor by issuing an urgent message for my fellow Americans. A bold message you Don't pull your back on your boy me, now. Or from the talking heads in Washington. Don't pull back on your it's boy, man. So woven into the fabric of our nation that it would be treason not to share it. In the following video, I reveal everything You'll see evidence for an economic upgrade. I'm just trying to so eat a hot pocket and make some money. So powerful, I'm calling it America 2.0. Those at the forefront, hopefully including you, will reap massive financial rewards. However, those who are unprepared will be left behind. Even worse, they could see absolute financial devastation. So please, take some time now to watch. As you'll see, this upgrade is not only imminent, it's already underway. Hi, I'm John Daly, and joining me today is the greatest investor of our time, Paul Mampilli. Paul, thanks for being here. 
Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, it's great to have you. Now, you've stated that America, oh, this country shoot. that we love so much, is about to undergo a massive economic upgrade. That's right, John. And this upgrade is going to be big. So big that citizens from every edge of our great nation, from farmers to doctors, and from 10-year-olds to 100-year-olds, will reap the benefits. And I believe that's just the start. Wow. Now, you've even stated... And I quote, this upgrade will fulfill our forefathers' vision of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all. That's exactly right, which is why I'm calling it America 2.0. America 2.0. Okay, now, I know this might come as a surprise <clears throat> to many of you who are watching. After all, the so-called experts would have us believe that America is falling apart. Here are a few recent headlines. The United States is broken as hell. The American dream may be dead. If you want the American dream, you should try Sweden. <laughs> John, nothing against Sweden. Lower, but Apple stock is trading well below where Ives is saying it should go. Dan, let's start with tracking people. <clears throat> what specifically is the government perhaps looking at? Yeah, what they're trying to do is trying to figure out where they can find hotspots and then use things <clears throat> like GPS uh, on smartphones and things along those lines to really figure out where people are and better get a handle of things like uh, localized outbreaks. And that's something that we've seen throughout the world using GPS, using smartphones, using the technology that's available right now to pinpoint where these hotspots are and then try to get treatment in there or try to better corral what's going on to get a better handle on what we're seeing of the outbreak. So it's an interesting way to look at it. Big tech obviously <clears throat> taking a lead uh, to a degree in this kind of uh, situation. You have Facebook, Microsoft, uh, Amazon stepping up, uh, Apple, uh, Google has their Verily page trying to provide people with information. It went down right away <coughs> because people were uh, swamping it so much. But obviously, big tech has a hand in this. And, you know, frankly, at uh, this point where they are so large, it almost behooves them to be uh, stepping up like this. Akiko? Yeah, yeah I, I think, you know, over the next several weeks, we're going to learn how far consumers and users are willing to give up their privacy because when you talk about a tracking device, this is the kind of thing that we saw over in Asia. You know, I mean, China has hundreds of surveillance or thousands, I should say, surveillance cameras. You know, a company like Tencent had put out the very kind of app that we're talking about or that Dan was just talking about, being able to detect where those patients are, those who tested positive for coronavirus, and then allowing people to see that map so that they don't necessarily... Uh, want to come in contact with them. We heard overnight that Ugh. Hong Kong is now putting electronic bracelets on people who are arriving from trips overseas. They will now be tracked as a result that to make sure that they are quarantining themselves as well. So there's no question big tech is going to be doing this. But I think you also have to ask the question, is this the kind of time where consumers are willing to give up their privacy for the sake of public health? And I'm not sure we have an answer on that yet. All right, we're going to go to break, but I want to let everybody know we're awaiting the coronavirus press conference. The task force is going to be doing that now, scheduled for 12 noon. And if you need just a little bit of a silver lining, something to consider as we watch the sell <coughs> off, at least for this tax year, 2020, all of us working from home, you get to deduct this workspace when you file your 2020 taxes in 2021. Let's hope that's only the most serious issue we have to deal with as we move through this crisis. Yahoo Finance has you covered, and we're going to be back after this. What's up, Blood Orchid? Bro, teach me how to make ten trillion dollars, man. What makes you think I got ten trillion dollars? Oh man. 
such a bad trade. Teach you how to forex? <clears throat> sure, man. S subscribe to my uh, page, man. I'll stream it as much as I can. Uh, it's been a little bit difficult because the way the market's been lately. But I'll stream it. Maybe I need to pull my stop loss back. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman. And as you can see, I'm not coming to you from our normal Yahoo Finance studios. Rather, I'm in my apartment <clears throat> in a corner of my living dining room, as we all are. And we're trying to abide by the guidelines that are coming to us from various municipal as well as the federal governments uh, to work from home. That's what I and the rest of the Yahoo Finance team are doing at this hour. Just want to bring you a few of the latest headlines. Damn, I need to put my stop loss back. Uh, with some more details around what a stimulus package might look like, both checks to individual Americans, as Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin talking about them. Just follow my page. Just a follow button. And totaling $500 billion I also stream on Facebook, uh, so Mixer, and YouTube. Eight packages for the airline industry. At the same time, we also got some headlines here from New York State, where Governor Andrew Cuomo said that cases had more than doubled overnight of COVID-19 to more than 2,300. At the same time, we also got a report a few moments ago that Bernie Sanders was dropping out of the race. His campaign has said that's not correct. And indeed, the full report from Axios said that he was suspending his advertising on Facebook, no more than that. So we'll continue to track all of this. And I'm joined by this hour, this hour by Adam Shapiro, uh, who was with us last year as well, Rick Newman, Jared Blickery, Melody Hum, and Dan Roberts, all of them of Yahoo Finance Gang. It's good to see you, um, even if we're not all in the same place. I know a lot of other Americans are experiencing the very same thing as we are right now. Um, I want to, if I can, start with Rick Newman. Rick, we've get, been getting a lot of commentary around what these various stimulus packages will look like. I know that we are awaiting comments from President Trump at a press conference, which maybe we'll have even more details on this. Talk to us about the latest thing you're <coughs> hearing in your reaction. There are going to be bailouts. That seems uh, without a doubt. Um, it's, it's actually quite interesting that we have this massive case study from 2008 and 2009, all the bailouts. I mean, there were tons of bailouts back then, the bank bailouts, which were known as uh, TARP, the Troubled Assets Relief Program, uh, and then the bailouts for the automakers, uh, General Motors and Chrysler, and many other companies that got direct or indirect bailouts. So uh, in a way, it's almost fortunate that we have all of that activity as a case study. I mean, there were trillions of dollars of bailouts back then. And we could uh, see the same scale of bailouts this time around. In Washington, of course, they're not, they don't want to call these bailouts, but that's what they are. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, after the fact analysis of what happened in the financial crisis. And we learned some good ways to do bailouts and bad ways to do bailouts. And there were definitely some lessons learned that I think you're seeing applied this time around. So we'll know more about that as the legislative uh, deals uh, move along. But I think, you know, the, some of the principles you're hearing about is don't just give money to companies. If you do give monies to company, money to companies, put conditions on it. Make sure that money uh, helps workers first and foremost and some other things like that. Don't allow companies to take bailouts and then award bonuses to the executives. Uh, so I think those are going to be important additions to what we see coming. Some of those were mistakes the last time around. Hopefully we will do better this time. Um, all of this talk of bailouts is not helping stocks at the moment. Just wanted to mention the S&P 500 right now trading lower by 5.4%. The Dow <coughs> is off 5.9%. Well, that was my second trade today. 0.3%. Remember, the next circuit breakers would be triggered at 7% so, for the major averages. Um, we did I'm probably going to get off for a bit, didn't play some video there. games. Let's talk more about a, an airline bailout specifically and what we're hearing on that front. Dan Roberts, I know you've got more on that. 
Yeah, uh, we are seeing that both Boeing and the airlines are now basically yeah. demanding. Yeah, I'm not playing Dota. What's interesting is how quickly the narrative Let's do shifted because uh, we, I think, saw this coming, and you're already seeing small businesses react pretty negatively. I feel like 